Okay, good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the March 30th, 2022 meet, uh, school board meeting. Can we please all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you very much. Uh, first item up tonight is uh, the minutes for the March 9th, 2022 regular meeting. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. Anyone have any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. We accept the minutes of the March 9th, 2022 regular board meeting. Okay, we are now on to our next item, which is a recognition of the class of 2022 valedictorian and salutatorian, Mr. Sal Lima. So good evening, I'm gonna just stand over here. Our Board of Education, Mr. Burns, thank you very much for this opportunity to recognize uh, our valedictorian and salutatorian. Before I start, I wanna share one of my favorite times of the school year is when I have the privilege of bringing down our valedictorian or salutatorian and making a special phone call or sometimes even being in person um, to make the announcement that they've just been selected as the valedictorian. And then their phone call home to their parents sharing that. It's some of my really favorite moments uh, in my school career to just see the faces light up as well as just to see them relieved because oof, the hard work. And I want to tell you the hard work of the class of 2022, as we recall, not only had to go through the normal challenges of every other student, but the challenges of through COVID and being home online. And the conversations that I've had with our valedictorian and salutatorian, it's been not only the work that they're doing at home, behind the screen, in person, but as well as with sometimes siblings and the importance of relying on a community to make sure you get through the challenges that you face. Not only do we have our teachers to thank, we have our board of education to thank, our administrators in the building, we have parents who are at home supporting them go through this process and siblings going through to make sure that they got to this level. So I am extremely proud of our valedictorian and salutatorian. And I want to talk to them briefly a little bit. So this is a preview to graduation. So if you attend, you may be hearing something very similar. <laughs> First, rank number one, leading the class of 2022 with an outstanding grade point average of 107.478. This young lady will not only graduate as an AP scholar with distinction, but will graduate with a mastery in both math and science, and has met all the necessary requirements for the AP capstone diploma, which is no easy feat, and it is amazing, uh, really amazing thing to have in your account. Having superb math and science grades, she was also the recipient of the Rensselaer Medal in her junior year. She is a dedicated ESM varsity soccer team, as well as a Skills Unlimited Soccer Academy. She has helped younger children through both our ESM Specialized Sports Club, as well as volunteering as a camp counselor for our summer youth soccer camp. Our valedictorian is a member of the Varsity Leaders Club and a member of three honor societies, namely the National World Language and English Honor Societies. She has participated in Kicks for Cancer and is involved with ESM's initiative to provide books to underprivileged children. Her philosophy on life is commitment, resilience, and perseverance will take you far. And it has taken her very far. We are extremely proud of her and her entire family. Sophia Pfeffer, class of 2022, valedictorian. Congratulations. about these two individuals is the way they can balance their life from the academics to the extracurriculars. Uh, our salutatorian is no different. He is ranked number two in the class with a GPA of 106.169. This AP scholar with distinction will be graduating again with an advanced research diploma with honors and with mastery 
in science and is a promising candidate for the AP Capstone Diploma this year. This young man's greatest strength reflected his mathematical and science abilities and the reason why he was nominated and awarded the University of Rochester's Xerox Award in his junior year. He is an accomplished musician who plays the bass and has been in our Honors Orchestra and Honors Wind Ensemble since ninth grade and very impressive throughout all those times as well. He's been an ESM first stand bass player and become an all-state bass player as well as serving as the treasurer of the After School Chamber Orchestra in which he is a member. He's not only part of our orchestra program as well as our varsity football team throughout high school, becoming an all-county football player and captain of the team both 11th and 12th grade, making all of it this community proud. Using his skills in a generous manner by organizing and coaching football practices for students in sixth grade and older during the COVID pandemic. He has made contributions in both the National and Tribal Music Honor Societies, and his philosophy of life is, don't pray for an easy life, pray for the strength to endure a difficult one. With an interest in helping others with modern technologies within the healthcare field, he would like to major in biomedical engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, our salute class of 2022 salutatorian, Joseph Thomas Morello. that our science students do throughout uh, our high school here and the science research program from when I've been here from when Mr. Steinel was here uh, as high school principal to today continues to be the effort of students not only during the school day but beyond and those efforts are really a contribution from not only our students their families but also their teachers one teacher, especially, who's been running our science research program has done an amazing job. I'd like to call him up here to talk about our science research program, Mr. Rob Rayner. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Thank you, Mr. Steinel, for uh, inviting us here tonight. Um, so, I'm going to ask the students to come up in a minute. Um, these students, they are the pride and joy of not only the school, but also our science department. I look forward to seeing them every day. They come to see me every day, not just during class, but 7.01 a.m. they're walking in the door, right? And we have our morning session, and it continues throughout the day. And they are truly remarkable. I'm in awe of their diligence and their resilience. I'm also in awe of their perseverance. And this year, for LICEF, 375 projects were submitted. Um, and our team was one of 89 that made it to the second round, semi-finalist round. In their category, they had 25 projects. They were one of eight projects that moved forward. So that, that is commendable. That is extraordinary. And the work that they're doing is, is real science. Um, their work is possible not only from the support that we get from the school, um, but also from their parents. Um, we had parents drive them out there. Um, we had their parents you know, help get things going with you know, getting everything set up with their uh, membership with the lab and, and making sure the appointments were set up. And it's been a true, a true dedication by them and their families. Um, we've also had a lot of support from the SPARC program at Brookhaven National Lab with Dr. Aleda Perez. We have a phenomenal relationship with them and these guys are hopefully getting back to the lab next year that they can get on site, fingers crossed, so that they can get the true experience of a lab culture. They're working on real world science and, and that's the important thing. Um, they're working on science that's contributing to scientific knowledge um, about protein structures, useful information that will help scientists move forward with advancements. And they also have skills that they're developing that are transferable to other fields and other disciplines. Of course, we want them to stay in science, but we know that different things will attract them, but these are skills that will stay with them forever and will open doors to opportunities that they don't even know exist yet. Um, these students are the first to successfully resolve the structure of this protein. I'm gonna, they're gonna tell you a little bit about the protein, we're gonna keep it short. Um, but our main goal is to give these young men and women the opportunity to work with authentic science research. 
uh, to have an experience where they can submit structures to the protein data bank, and, and we're looking forward to doing that in the next few weeks, and then publish to a peer-reviewed scientific publication sometime during this calendar year. So I'd like to, should I call them up? I'll call them up. So you guys can all come on up. We have Jane Brailuski, uh, Aiden Young, Thomas Lavalli, Leah Doty, Kiara Mehta, Benjamin Isaacson, and Fiona Schlegel. And they're going to come on up. They have their posters. They'll tell you a brief story about the work they've done. Um, can we put it on the table? Get right on the table. Well, they're dressed very professionally for this presentation. Great master. Who's going to go first? <laughs> okay. Um, so, good evening. Um, like we said before, uh, well, I'm Fiona. Um, so, we, our project was to determine the structure of a protein, and like Bolin mentioned, this protein has never been resolved before, so this is the first known structure of said protein. Uh, so, what, why this is important is because this protein has been linked to diseases such as John's disease and Crohn's disease. And so Crohn's can be found in humans, and John's is uh, prominent in ruminant animals, such as cattle. And both these diseases have uh, serious health effects. So a potential way to treat these diseases would be using the structure of the protein and potentially developing drugs based off of the structure, which would um, kill the bacteria and therefore stop the disease. So uh, Ben's going to tell you a little bit more about what we actually did with this structure. Yep, so uh, to get the structure, we started by, we had some of our protein supply, and we, this, we got a, we crystallized the protein, which is made, we set it up in a, a you know, solution with different chemicals in it, so that we could basically shoot it with a bunch of x-rays. And what the x-rays allow you to do is take the protein and generate sort of a map of where all the electrons that are in the protein fall, because the protein is technically just made up of a bunch of atoms, and so you have all these different, you know, here's kind of a visualization of, you know, some of the atoms of the protein, one part of the protein, and long story short, what you do is you get a three-dimensional structure of the protein as it would be in, you know, bacteria. And right here is kind of, you know, a few snapshots of what it ended up looking like, but by, getting a good idea of what the most important parts of the protein actually would be, you know, how they would be folded and formed, you can get an idea of what chemicals or drugs might be able to best target the protein to stop it from working. And once again, if you can stop it from working successfully, then you should be able to kill the bacteria because the bacteria needs this protein to survive. And there's some stats out here about our uh, data itself, but for the most part, our data was of an, a decent enough quality that they can be published to the protein data bank, which, as Bullen mentioned, is something we hope to do so that you know other scientists can build on it and in the future more research can be done about this protein, you know, to stop the diseases that, it, that the bacteria causes. Hi, uh, I'm Jane. I'm Jose. Yeah. <laughs> I'm <I'm> Ben. <laughs> Actually, I'm Ben and he's Jane. <laughs> so it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, like Ben previously mentioned, we were able to determine the structure down to um, 2.34 angstroms, which is a pretty low resolution. Um, and by having a low resolution, it means that um, it's a pretty reliable structure and it's valid. Um, um, so the protein does contain a link region, but we were not able to... What is link region? Sorry, sorry, this is... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> But it, it has a link region, and we were able to determine its structure through um, this kind of 
The Laker region is um, a highly flexible area that joins the two like halves of the protein, um, and it because it's so yeah because it's so flexible. Um, it's hard to get a uh, resolution of it because it's like you're running and you're trying to take a photo, it just comes out blurry. Uh, so, but that's something in the future we hope to resolve better. Thanks, Fiona. <laughs> um, um, and by determining structure, we are able to, if we would like, we are able to identify potential inhibitors um, that can start this protein. <laughs> Okay, um, so inhibitors are something that would bind to the protein instead of its normal ligand, which this group will talk about more. And so that's going to stop the uh, bacteria from uh, the protein from working, which will kill the, bac uh, the bacteria and combat the diseases. Um, so inhibitors are just one type of drug that would do that. Yeah, yeah. So um, we determined the structure of this. We were the first ones to determine it, and uh, we had SAH here. I just want to talk about a couple of main regions here. Um, so within the structure, um, the SAH binds to the active site, which um, is the whole importance of this, is that determining this active site will actually help us in um, basically helping scientists to find future cures for Crohn's disease and joint disease. It treats so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> protein as a target for drugs to treat Crohn's disease. Because of the growing problem of antibiotic resistance, that is why these tRNA methyltransferases have become more 
possible targets to avoid this. And with these structures resolved, hopefully they can provide the basis for research which ultimately will help treat or maybe cure. Of course. Thank you. you guys followed along as much as I did. So I know it's not easy to listen here and talk about science stuff for a good 20 minutes. But believe me, it is fun. And these, I have to say these are the most incredible people to work with. Um, they're all individually great and talented. You know, we wouldn't have been able to do this alone without Mr. Bowen. And I just want to say, you know, this work isn't all, it, it's not easy. It's extremely hard. So give it up for <laughs> so the, the team that went to the Long Island Science and Engineering Fair, they placed fourth overall. Um, two of them have their medals on, those are the little medals they're wearing around their necks. So um, we're also continuing on, we're going to the Long Island Science Congress. Uh, it's a virtual fair, so they'll be submitting. And um, we actually have some different team members. Lee is one of the members that will be submitting for that. Um, the, and then don't go away, guys. Don't sit down. We have some... No, you can put those back. Okay. And then come back. Yes. So we have some certificates uh, to recognize these students for the great work they've done. Um, again, I'm proud to work with them. It's a joy being with you guys. Every day is fun. Um, we're doing great things, and the future is bright because of you guys. And so I thank you for everything you've done, and I'm looking forward to this year and next year. I know some of you guys are graduating. Kiara, I'm going to miss you. Um, and then I don't know what's going to happen if you guys leave. I'm, I'm going to be overcome. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> um, but I'd like to uh, go ahead with the awards now. Um, so. Jane Brylewski, come forward. <laughs> James Cortez isn't here tonight, but he will be receiving his certificate. Leah Doty. <laughs> ben Isaacson. Thomas Lavalley. Just came back from a tennis match, too. Please don't quit. We have Chiara Meta. Chiara, where are you going to school again? You just let everybody know? Right, Emory University. Santino Racine couldn't be here tonight, so we'll take care of him tomorrow. Fiona Schlegel. And last but not least, we have Aiden Young. And again, thank you for having us here. Thank you for all the support. Mr. Steinmel, you and I, many years ago, sat down and said, okay, let's hammer this out, let's figure out how to do this, and, and this is the fruit of that labor. So, again, I appreciate that. We had an idea, and we went with it, and, and you guys are amazing, so thank you. Thank you all. brought the children here tonight and really appreciate it. You do not have to stay for the whole meeting. You can go home. I know you have to get up. You gotta study, you gotta go to school tomorrow, you gotta be there by seven. So uh, the horrible people put you through tests tomorrow. Thank you very much. Excellent job everybody. Thank you.
had a meeting with adults and I felt fairly intelligent. Right. And we had the kids come in. <laughs> suddenly I don't feel so smart. <laughs> We are choosing to stand because we have a lot of exciting things to talk about and to sit. We just can't show our excitement. So just give us a second to get ready. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having us this evening. We are very excited to be here to talk about everything technology. Now I know I was just here at the last meeting talking about the budget and I know you've had presentations from the principals of things that have been going on, um, but we're going to go a little more in depth now talking about what's been going on in the classrooms. So first I'd like to give a shout out to our technology team because we would not be able to do everything that we do in the schools without them. So Charlie, Eric, Jen, Tara, Joe, Fernando, Francine, Ronnie, they are doing a lot of great work, not just on the network and our inventory, great fix, um, our insurance claims, our state reporting, hardware installs, software support, training, they do it all. So I just wanted to make sure we acknowledge them this evening as well. This year we also have a new member of our technology team. We have Mrs. Meredith Kramer. She has been in the district for 24 years, but this is her first year as the technology integration specialist. And she did a lot of prep work last summer, preparing for this position, and I'm going to let her talk a little bit about what she's been doing. Hello, Hello everybody. It's so wonderful to be here today. Um, yeah, so I've been in the district for 24 years. I started as a K-6 computer teacher um, back in 1997, and then I taught second grade, third grade, and 18 years later, um, all swing around. And I am just thrilled to be in this position, and I absolutely love what I'm doing. Um, I've done a lot of work at home, and during the summer, as uh, Dr. Holmes said, um, I've become a Seesaw ambassador um, for the program Seesaw, which we'll explain in a little uh, while and uh, Flipgrid ambassador, um, book creator, certified author, and my position is great, it's very flexible, where every single day I go into a different building. So um, Monday I'm at East Ford, and Tuesday I'm at Tuttle, and Wednesday I'm at Dayton, and Thursday at South Street, and Friday we should be planning with Dr. Colney, and it's just been fabulous. And actually I have created a website uh, using the acronym TEDS, each of the four elementary schools, and just putting on some websites and different um, bookshelves that are virtual that they can use with their um, classes, putting it on their um, Google Classroom. So there's a lot of different material on there, different how-tos and different PDFs that they can check out. And um, that's a little bit about me. There's that Ted's website. So some of the other work we have been doing is writing our district's instructional technology plan. So that was actually up as of 2021, but because of COVID, uh, NYSID actually extended it for all the school districts, so it has to be submitted this year. So we got a committee together, and we did put together our instructional technology mission statement as a group. We really looked at what was important. What did we want to see for our students, for our teachers? So I'm not going to read it, uh, but the presentation will be up on the website, so if anybody's interested, you'll be able to see it. 
In addition, we also had to come up with a minimum of three goals for our instructional technology plan. So we really wanted to make sure we were focusing on professional learning opportunities for teachers, the upcoming computer science and digital fluency learning standards, and really making sure that we have technology-rich experiences for students. So those will be our three goals that we'll be focusing on over the next three years. Now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of all the things that we do technology. And we decided to do like an A to Z theme because we just have so much going on. So we want to be a little organized for you. And you'll see we have our own hashtag called hashtag Shark Tech. And for our STEAM initiative, we have hashtag ESM STEAM. We have one of our STEAM TAs here who came here to support us as well. So thank you. Uh, so any of the tweets that you see that have those two hashtags, it's probably one of us doing it. Although the principals are using ESM STEAM too now when they're in their STEAM rooms. So starting with N, one of the programs we are using, uh, especially at the junior senior high school level, is the Adobe Creative Cloud. Uh, it's a program that I'm sure you've heard of uh, uh, Adobe Photoshop, uh, programs like that. So they have a suite of programs that they can use to really create a lot of different things. So this is samples of student work that they've been doing. I was blown away that students were able to do this because I definitely could not. Uh, I did talk to Mr. Bridgewood who's using it in his classes. Uh, so he gave us a little quote about what they're doing in their computer graphics classes and how students are using it. So we just, we want to just highlight a little bit of student work, uh, information that we've received from teachers through all the programs that we're using throughout the district. We talked about the BenQ boards at the last board meeting when we talked about the budget. So in, from 2020 to 2022, we have 138 BenQ boards installed or mobile boards available. And we are looking in the 2022-2023 school year to continue that plan and do installs at the K-2 classrooms and then also beginning in the special area classrooms. And I happened to be in the classroom doing an observation, and the teacher was using the board so perfectly that in the middle of the observation, I was like, oh, I'll take a picture so I put it in my presentation. Book Creator. So this program has been absolutely amazing. I was using this last year, the year before, with my class teaching second grade. And Book Creator is an amazing program for creating and publishing. And um, I know the teachers are using it for their um, units in Teachers College, so they're publishing, the students are publishing their books. Here's an example of actually a, a fifth grade uh, class in one of the three through six buildings. And it's great, because students have choice, they have voice, and they're really creating these books for an authentic audience. And the teachers can create URLs where they can send them home and the parents can see their books, the grandparents, people from far away, they can create QR codes, which they've been doing, and they've been hanging them up in the hallways, and the students actually come out with the Chromebooks and scan them. They're able to share and read each other's books, which has been absolutely fantastic. This actually is a second grade class. So they were doing their nonfiction unit, and they published books. So I go into the classes, I do a lot of professional development, and I show not only the teachers, but the children at the same time. So they're learning, and the teachers are learning, the teachers are learning, and the teachers have many uh, bookcases with a whole bunch of different themes of different books, and it's the students are so excited to write. A lot of times, it's, oh, it's, it's writing time. Oh, but we're using Book Creator. It's, it brings it to a whole new level. And as you can see here, the, um, the analytics, uh, since September, there's been 104 teachers that have logged in and have created accounts. And there's been over 8.4 thousand books that have been created. These kids just, they create at home. They create at their free time. They create at recess. They just, the, the amount of books is just, absolutely amazing, and each one that I've seen are just unbelievable. The graphics, the, the comics they put in, the uh, images, just the sounds, they can take videos of themselves, they can take pictures, they do about the author page, and it just becomes so real, and it's great because they're really writing for an audience, not just their teacher or not just for other students. 
So Clever is on every student's Chromebooks. And Clever is a single sign-on portal, and they click on Clever, and then they can get to iReady. They can get to BookRater. They can get to the site really quickly without having to remember their passwords, because there's so many passwords. So they, they click, and it's all synced right through um, Synergy. So it's been, it's been great because it does away with the passwords. That and was one of the biggest challenges the teachers had complaints at all the time. That yes. Yes, the boys and girls had to log in each time, each time, and this eliminated that. Yeah, it was so many times. Yeah. Was, you know, was, oh, what's the I ready password again? Is it ESM dot or is it ESM? They, they go to Clever, and they, and they can also do it at home. So they go to Clever, and they don't have to remember any passwords. They get right on, and it's really been fantastic. They're all pinned right on their Chromebooks, so um, they know the little, I, I go to a kindergarten class, and they're like, I know, we have to go to Clever, and then we go to uh, Seesaw. I'm getting get older, I wish you would put it on ours. <laughs> oh, no. So many <laughs> And you can see the, um, the analytics, I mean, there's so many, there's 236.2 thousand students that are utilizing, that includes the amount of logins that we have. So on a daily basis, they must you know, log in multiple times throughout the day, depending on apps that they're working on. And the Chromebooks, it's great that we have a one-to-one -one initiative, which is fantastic. And uh, we have uh, 3,809 Chromebook devices. Um, and that includes teachers and TAs and substitutes. Um, but every student has one. And um, they bring it to school. And it's fantastic. So in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, I was doing another observation, and I was in a music classroom, and the, the teacher was using the keyboards, but there were only about six keyboards that the teacher could use. So she had the students pull up a keyboard on their Chromebook, and the students were either on their Chromebook playing, or they were on the actual keyboard playing. And it was just such a fantastic way for them to all be involved. Um, the bottom right-hand corner, that's one of our STEAM labs, and than just student, students using them as they go about their days. They're, you just walk by classrooms, kids are on them. So it's been really great having this one-to-one -one initiative. Whether they're using it for first in math, or iReady, or, or, or Seesaw, Book Reader, um, they're being utilized not all day, but many times throughout the day. So Plus Connections is, is actually a new program in the K-2 building, uh, foreign language in the elementary school. And I partnered up a few months ago with our plus teacher in both buildings. She works at South Street and Tuttle. And she wanted to learn how to do Seesaw and how to do book, book Reader and how to get the kids to start doing Lingo. So we did a little collaboration and I followed her along and there were some Spanish words along the way. And it was great because the students actually had in front of them one of the pictures, um, two pictures, they had the, the colors in Spanish, and they had to click and drag and drop the correct colors. And we gave them little guides to help them, and we got them onto Duolingo, and they were practicing. It was fantastic. And she was so excited that she was integrating technology in Spanish with her Spanish lessons. And it was really a uh, successful collaboration that we had. And we're going to actually continue uh, creating some more books and book reader. We're up to G. So Go Guardian, we rolled out Go Guardian last year, but we just did the admin part where we were just being able to filter students' Chromebooks. This year we rolled out Go Guardian Teacher, which allows teachers to see what the students are doing while they are in the classroom. Um, it, it gives the teachers the opportunity to help students make sure that they're on task. Uh, students can ask the teacher a question privately in a little chat. So we're just looking at our statistics of you know, what we've been using, how we've been using it. In the left-hand side, that's what a teacher sees, the different tabs that are open, so you'll see the little icons. Uh, it has like Google Classroom icon, Clever icon, uh, Google Slides icons, so they can really you know, support student learning and know everything that is going on. And also the nice thing is that uh, teachers can also send messages, like a little chat message. So they see that students are just sitting there not working, they can say, hey, do you, you need help? Is there a problem? So it's a really a great tool for 
and especially the kindergarten teachers love it because sometimes these kids have like 45 billion tabs open so they can even go and they can close those windows for them. But it, I've been doing uh, professional development in the schools and the teachers really love using Go Guardian. It's really been a fantastic new program that we just introduced. And of course we always have Google. On K-6 level, we're using Google Classroom. Throughout the district, we're using Google Drive, Docs, Sheets, Slides, Forms, Jamboard. We have the admin portion that helps us track and monitor all of our Chromebooks, um, making sure that they're all getting their updates that they need. Uh, across the top, you see what a student would see when they go to their Google Classroom homepage. So that's a student that belongs to five different classrooms currently. And we were looking at the usage, so we wanted to show you a little data of how things are being used. So that, uh, that graph shows you the activity of Google Drive. And where you see those two dips, that was February break, and then that was February break. Oh, yeah, December break and February break. So everybody wasn't using their Chromebooks at home. They were enjoying time with family and friends. It was very nice. So, but we can see how that usage, how, how it just remains. Then, yeah, I think that is Thanksgiving, that little, that little blip. Yeah. <laughs> then in the bottom right-hand corner, we had a teacher that was doing, using Jamboard. And you can see how the student was participating in that Jamboard uh, right real time with that teacher. So the Google platform has really uh, allowed us to be much more collaborative across buildings, within the classrooms, uh, across grade levels. So we're just going to keep you going down the Google path. Sounds like foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> Just Maybe Just a little. We're up to K. All right, so Cami, Cami is actually a really powerful tool. Um, Cami can be used. Uh, teachers can upload PDFs. They can upload docs. They can upload um, any kind of resource. And students can write over it. They can draw over it. They can highlight different text. And it has a lot of accessibility features, especially for the ENL students, for the L learners. Um, and it has a lot of, uh, has a read aloud feature, and it has different language languages. So the accessibility features is really what um, makes this program so special. Um, and there are many, as I said, there's many, a lot of accessibility features that many students might need to help them be successful in class. So. Um, and where students are able to actually annotate on a PDF. So a teacher can create a PDF and a student can actually be annotating, writing, drawing, coloring. So you see there's a Venn diagram. A uh, student had to put the different information in the different pieces. So it's just a great tool. So Kibos were just introduced in the K-2 STEAM labs this year. And Kibos are amazing because they're screen free, they're unplugged, and they're little coding robots, and they're very basic. Where and every student, every kid in the world loves to scan. They go to a grocery store, they want to scan, they want to help their parents you know, scan the item. And that's exactly what it is. You actually create a code and you scan it, and then you click on play. Like this video that Dr. Foley just pulled up. Yeah, so the students are actually creating a code, so they have to decide what, they, what do they want the robot to actually do. They can create, they design, they decorate, they bring their robot to life. And there's so many really amazing activities that they can do. So the lights can turn on, the lights can turn off, they can send a message, you can talk into it. Uh, so they can have a parade. Um, just today they were doing keyboard bowling in the, in the steam labs. So it brings coding really to the next level. <laughs> and then also in our steam labs this year we have oh, so we've had kid io in the school district uh, this year we did a kickoff at the K6 level. We went to we had kiddo yo mentors come to each of the buildings and we did an assembly and a kickoff and we had challenges. Kids were challenging other students. 
uh, students were challenging their principals, students were challenging their teachers, and it seems that children won every single time. Uh, at the 712 level, uh, I talked with Mr. Gosselin about how he is using Kidoyo in his classroom. So he's using it in his STEM class. He is also the hackathon coach. They are the champions, and they will be defending that uh, trophy this year. And this year, we also had our junior high team uh, participate in a hackathon as well. So we're really trying to build up the uh, computer literacy for our students with coding. So here's our Lego, Spike, and Brick Cube Motion Essentials, and this is in the K-6 building. So uh, three through six has the spike in the brick cube at, uh, of the K-2 building. And again, they are creating their specific lesson plans um, and tasks that students work on collaboratively. And they engage students through playful learning activities. And it's really thinking critically. You know, there's a lot of building and engineering and just really amazing critical thinking uh, going on. It helps students learn essential skills uh, for the 21st century. Steve is really becoming like the hot, the hot item now is, you know, you hear steam, you hear steam, and it's really um, opening up their minds for tomorrow and getting them college ready. And we have just a little video. Two, one, go! <laughs> so with Pancasters, we have one of each of, actually every building, four elementary and the junior senior high school, and this year so far, uh, Dayton Avenue Eastport has had a spelling bee, and they, they use the Pancaster during their spelling bee, and they use the Google Meet instead of having everybody coming into the uh, gym, so they live streamed it. And the Library Media Center uh, is at Eastport. And that Dayton are using it for backgrounds, so using the green screen. So you can see there that there's some cute little pictures of little Hollywood, um, Hollywood, and they receive some summer reading certificates. So um, you can find any background, and if you feel like you're in Disney World or you're a Yankees game, Mets game, wherever you want to be. So it's and you'll see it at our Steam night too. Well, when we were doing Zoom meetings, we would try to outdo each other with backgrounds too. <laughs> The green <laughs> well, one of us had it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seesaw. All right, so this is another one of my favorites. Seesaw, I've been going into all the kindergarten, first, second grade classrooms at South Street and at Tunnel Avenue. And I'm actually a Seesaw ambassador, which means I took classes, and then after a certain amount of time, you're invited to become an ambassador, which I can create lessons and I can post it to the Seesaw community, which has over 2 million members, as well as the ESM community. So I'll create lessons uh, for our teachers here, and then they can take it, they can edit it, they can use it if they want. And I've been going into the classes, the actually a couple of the bottom ones are kindergartners using Seesaw, and lots of amazing lessons. They're using, they're using math, they're drawing, they are reading, they're, they're writing on it, they can record their voices, they can take pictures. So it's really a, an amazing tool, and it goes into their journal. So they can see from September to June, all the different activities and all the different um, pictures that they've created. And it's, the teachers approve it, and the teachers comment on it. So it's really been an amazing program. And here are the analytics. Um, the top one is South Street School, with 8,016 posts. Um, and then at the bottom, is at Tuttle Avenue. So you can see the upward trend. This is this year. So it's, just, it's going up and up and up. And I know as I walk through the buildings every day, Seesaw is it's always it's being used all the time. And it's just a great resource. And there's amazing lessons and you can find them in the community of different, whether it's math or science or, so, or social studies. So I've been supporting the teachers and creating lessons for them as well. So this year we also changed to a new student management system, Synergy. Uh, one of the things that it's been able to do for us is kind of bring everything into one place. 
It's also allowed us to do the digital access survey for parents that we have to do for New York State. We have parent view and student view, so parents can log in, students can log in, they can see real-time grades, they can see their report cards, they get messages, they get notifications, they get attendance letters. Uh, we also had a building use it for parent-teacher conference appointments. Uh, we have online registration. Mrs. Murray, how do you like that? And it's much easier to use than any of our previous systems with our third-party data syncing, because a lot of times we had to do manual uploads, daily, weekly, up to other systems. Now everything is just, it, it just syncs. We don't have to do anything. It's so much better. So we are moving forward with Synergy, and I know we're rolling out a couple of other pieces of it, um, but so far, we're getting there. And I know with the parent view, it's wonderful. Because I'll be, a, I think I'm the one up here with the oldest children who've been through here. I used to find out that my kids were missing assignments just before meeting with the teacher, or and you're like, you know, I hope there's nothing surprising, and then you show up, and now it's an everyday. It's right here. I just, it's funny you just look at it. I have it right here to look at it at any point in time. I think it's awesome. Thank you. Okay. Great. My son loves. He <laughs> <laughs> should be using student view. No, 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 he loves the fact that I have a parent view. Uh, maybe he doesn't. Uh, oh, are you being sarcastic? I just found one missing right now. You reminded me. I'm, I'm, I'm literally searching and circling, and I'm texting to him. So, text help is similar to Cami. So, it's a, an extension on Google Chrome, and every student has this as well. And they can use read and write for um, translation, so it's great for ENL students. So they can put it in their language and they still can follow along or they can highlight and they can read the words to them if they're not sure what the words are. It has great accessibility features. Um, it can highlight the text, it reads it to you with different voices, different speed, different pitch. Um, it's very customizable. It's great for students with disabilities, for the ENL learners. It's actually great for all learners. Uh, when they see it, it's, there's, there's so much to it. I mean, it's really a versatile tool that it works on on docs and it works in most of the um, most of Google, so it's really a, a, a great program and it really gives kids confidence, and independence because nobody knows that they're, they're using it. So if they're struggling, they can just click on it and there's read and write, and nobody has to know that they're being assisted in any way. And then there's some quotes of some teachers that across the district that have been using read and write. So one of our goals with this presentation was really to get you to understand what we have, what we're doing, what our teachers are doing, and what our students are doing. Uh, so we couldn't fit all of our letters in, so we had to create another slide. Uh, some of, this is most of all the other programs we are using across the district. Um, I'm sure there are a few that we have forgotten, but we, we support our teachers with all of these tools because it's what is best for students, and that's our goal. And most of these can be found in Clever. So when they go to Clever, they'll see these, depending on, obviously, which grade level they're at. So of course, for the future, what are we looking to do? We looked at, we're looking at the anatomage table that we saw at the last meeting, um, more BenQ boards. We'll be looking into the computer science and digital fluency standards. We're, we'll be exploring those instructional technology plan goals that we are setting. Of course, we're going to introduce a few new tools and resources for teachers and students. Uh, we really want to do more professional development. When we were looking at some of the data, we saw that uh, not many teachers are using Google Forms. And it's really uh, in a, an impressive tool where they can collect data and get a lot of information. So it's one of the things, looking at all this data that we have, what, where do our teachers need more help? Where do they need more support? And that was one of the ways. We're also looking at offering summer opportunities for staff, uh, the summer at Richmond for students. I know Dr. Christie is going to be talking about that. We will be transitioning to Gmail for all staff very soon. And while we were doing this presentation, Meredith and I came across this, that sharks don't swim backwards. All about the future, all about moving forward. So. That's what we are. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments, but we do have something else for you to do. So we didn't mention QR codes, but we're pretty 
big on QR codes. And if you don't know what a QR code is, you, you probably see them in restaurants, and there are these little black and white squares that you scan with a device, and just you, all you need is a camera, and it'll pick it up. So we have created something for all of you. I feel like I'm on Shark Tank for yourselves. <laughs> Hello, 1.2 million so far. I'd like to say thank you. I mean, I, I, one of the, our primary goal up here, and, and not primary, but our job up here as board members is to leave the district better than when we first got it. And, and you know, I, I know I'm stepping away after this year, but I feel very comfortable and very, very proud of the fact that we were able to put this together, and it can only get better for the future. So I just want to say thank you very much. If, if you guys yeah. are doing one hell of a job, thank you. Thank you very much. Another thing is, we're actually able to get Wi-Fi now in the building, so we can use these QR codes. <laughs> you know, so so in, the, in the booklet, we've highlighted some tweets um, about some of the different programs that we are using, and then we have a QR code that leads you to an example of something from those tweets. Either a video or a picture. We figured we couldn't do it all. We Mr. Steinel told me 15 minutes. I don't know how long we've gone. Hey. <laughs> it was very impressive. Yeah, nice job. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. No, no questions, just a comment. You know, one of the things that uh, I wanted to bring to the board for myself was that, you know, working in another district, being a technology guy, um, when, the, when the pandemic hit, seeing kind of where we were and where we were going, I mean, you guys have done an incredible job in, in a short time bringing this technology to the teachers, getting them to use it, uh, the comfort with the students, uh, you know, it, it's excellent. You know, the, the, the array of the programs that you have here is fantastic. And some of the stuff like the, the Adobe uh, Creative uh, Cloud, you know, I've been using that for 17 years uh, in my business. Uh, that's, you know, that's how I make some money for my family. These kids are learning great skills that are going to be very valuable for them in the future. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. We couldn't do it without our support, so we appreciate that. Thank you. Just one quick comment over here. Um, yeah, just, just quickly to, think, uh, to echo what uh, Mr. Burns said, it's really, really impressive to see how quickly things have moved forward just like that. Um, it's awesome, it's really awesome to see all these great features and these great um, new platforms that our students are using. Um, it's cool that, uh, that Google are trans transitioning more towards Gmail and Google stuff is that even for faculty and staff, if they, um, you know, can, if they harness it right, it will dramatically reduce their workflow and make things a lot better. Um, you know, I use the, I use, currently use the um, old SMS that we used here, and it's not great. But one of the cool things it's able to do is, I'll keep my grades in Google Classroom and I can sync it up and it saves me hours, otherwise I have to keep it in the book. So hopefully our, our teachers will, you know, will learn those type of things too to even make their lives a lot easier and put that workflow. So it benefits both students and teachers alike. So thank you so much for all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe one day in the future, um, you guys can, if the board wants to, we can make one of these for the board of ed that we hand out to community members and they could QR code and figure out what all of our different committees do and walk in stuff that. This is awesome. This is a great idea. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we are now on to reports and announcements. Mr. Spimel, I just have one, well, two quick, two quick things. Uh, today we, uh, not today, today was the second day of our ELA 3 to 8 exams. Um, just quickly, we've had more students participate, which is our goal. Uh, but we won't have the exact numbers because we also have to include the absences, et cetera. And so we'll report out on that, uh, as well as the results from when they get back. And the second thing is we have a lot of presentations tonight, so I don't want to take a, a, a lot of time here, but um, we've had a lot happen uh, with our students. You saw some, some things here uh, in the last few months in very positive ways. We've had essay winners. We've had uh, artwork that's being displayed at museums and, and, and with congressmen. Um, I really encourage everybody, if you don't, take a look at our website, get, get, you know, sign on to our, the district Facebook page, Sign on to our Twitter accounts. If you want to know what's happening in the Judge Building, our building principals do a great job with Twitter and what's happening. And you'll see 
posts going up every single day. We get a real flavor of what's happening. So I really encourage you to look there um, because the, you know everyone's doing. You know, so much is happening, and uh, the, in, a, in a positive way. And our students will be recognized all over the place. We can take a look at our website and look at all the stories that are going by in the back. Just please take a few minutes to go on there and click on them, and, and uh, you should be proud of all the work that you're doing here. Um, and, and the opportunities you create for the students to excel. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now we're on to curriculum. Item one is the Scope Summer Enrichment Program. Dr. Crispy. Synergy as uh, we're a leader in these schools, and we, you know, we look at uh, Habit 6 and see the synergy between the two of them, and then how it, uh, it, it translates to our teachers, our classrooms, and our students, and is really transforming uh, what we do as a district. It's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, so, uh, my presentation is, is going to be a somewhat similar theme. I, I, instead of theme to see, I went with uh, Scope Summer Enrichment to Infinity. That might be a little bit. All right, Charlie, I might need your help. All right, is, is that thing on? I will advance it. Switch on, it is. Oh, wait. There we go. Thank you, Charlie. The switch is not on. Uh, so just, uh, just, just uh, a, look, a quick look backwards. Um, uh, last year, we, uh, I'll say, we stuck our toe in the summer enrichment water. And uh, this summer, uh, we hope with the uh, service agreement that you uh, have this evening, uh, we, we're hoping to dive into the deep end of the pool. Uh, last year, we offered opportunities uh, to include cradle of aviation field trips in grades one through three and four through six, uh, outdoor environmental education field trips uh, to Caleb Smith Park, grades one and three, and Sunken Meadow uh, State Park, grades four and six. Uh, we had a partnership with uh, Kid Oyo in grades one, two, three, five, six, eight. Um, in the junior uh, high school, we uh, provided uh, IXL opportunities for our boys and girls that would be taking eighth grade algebra this year. Um, we also provided uh, the opportunity for our boys and girls in grades K-6 to uh, continue their uh, work with their personalized instruction in their MyPath and iReady. Um, and teachers supervised and provided feedback uh, to those students throughout the summer. And uh, they were recognized uh, with uh, uh, field days uh, this fall when they came back to each one of their elementary schools. And our K-2 principals provided uh, summer reading uh, to families uh, each week uh, for the entire summer. And what's nice about some of these is those partnerships have continued and now are really an extension of uh, what's taking place in our schools each day. Uh, we have a formal relationship with Cradle of Aviation. They're coming into our uh, classes this year in grades one, uh, K, three and four, and our third and fourth graders uh, in May will also be going to the of Aviation uh, for an uh, extension uh, field trip at, at the Cradle of the Museum itself. Uh, Kid Oyo, as uh, Barrett and Carol mentioned, uh, is uh, taking place in each one of our uh, buildings, K-6, and it's uh, integrated uh, into our STEAM experiences. Uh, so, and the outdoor environmental education field trips. Uh, this year we have in grades two, uh, grade two is going to Sunken Meadow. Grade five is going to Caleb Smith Park. Uh, grade six, which we've had for a while, goes to Sunken Meadow. And they did that in the fall, and that's really an opportunity for our sixth graders at Eastport and Dayton to have kind of a transition experience. Um, and it's a team building opportunity as well, so that's gonna continue. Uh, next year, we move the outdoor environmental education experiences into grades one and four, and uh, the following year to K-3. Uh, so similar to uh, Science 21, which next year will be uh, K-5, our outdoor environmental experiences within the next two years will be K-6 experiences. So these are relationships that we started uh, last summer 
uh, some of them we had previously, but they've, uh, they've, they've grown from summer to really kind of an integral part of what we do. Um, now this year, um, what we're really looking forward to, um, sometime October, November, we, we thought to ourselves, these experiences were great, but they were one day experiences. So if you were a boy and girl in grades four through six, uh, you went to um, Sunken Meadow one day, and you went to the Cradle of Aviation one day, and it was about a two and a half hour experience with Kidoyo. Um, this year, uh, we looked to partner uh, with uh, SCOPE for Summer Enrichment, and uh, SCOPE Educational Services designs and implements high quality enrichment pro programs across Long Island. Um, they've been in the business of developing really rigorous experiences from Saturday programs to summer enrichment to all year enrichment. Uh, we're already partners with them in our UPK program. And I have to tell you, uh, just since we started kind of uh, having the dialogue back in the fall, um, they're gonna be great partners. And that's what it really is. It's truly a partnership between SCOPE and Eastport South Manor. Um, each one of you received one of the registration flyers uh, that will be going home uh, to parents. Our goal is to um, uh, have it out on uh, Friday uh, of this week. Uh, the registration flyer uh, will be sent uh, K-12, and that's a really another nice component of this partnership. These are experiences that our boys and girls will be able to have from uh, rising kindergartners through our incoming seniors next year. It's also going to be, this is going to be really nice. Uh, we're going to reach out to the uh, junior senior high school administration and our guidance department, and we're going to look to provide opportunities for our uh, graduating seniors and our re recent graduates uh, to be able to participate and, uh, and work in the SCOPE program. Uh, there may be children or, or young adults uh, that are going in the field of education themselves, uh, so we're going to look to uh, target those uh, young men and women and uh, provide them an opportunity to uh, give back to the district and and, uh, and also have an opportunity to have some summer work for themselves. Um, we're also going to target students. We're going to invite students, K-12, um, for academic enrichment in ELA and, <coughs> and that'll be done in collaboration uh, with the building administration and NTSS teams in each one of the buildings. Uh, boys and girls that we uh, invite and target for ELA and math opportunities um, will are going to be uh, fully tuitioned uh, into those ELA uh, and math opportunities. Uh, we're also going to provide this opportunity for our ENL students, uh, K-12. Um, the program uh, cost is offset by the American Rescue Plan funding, uh, both this summer and next summer, and our goal is to grow into the program um, and see where we are. I really work very closely uh, with NC, the uh, uh, scope administrator in kind of determining exactly how many uh, classes we wanted to run in our first year um, to make sure that we struck the right balance. Um, so uh, you see in the flyer that I uh, provided for each one of you, uh, the course the courses K-12, and they really are, uh, they're kind of a, a really kind of rich, kind of diverse experience from uh, fitness and athletics um, to uh, STEAM, engineering, uh, the arts, uh, they also have a, a, a theater program uh, which runs K-5 and 612, and so, you know, and we also have opportunities for college uh, essay writing and SAT prep, uh, so it's, it's really, uh, I'm really, really excited for our uh, middle school and our uh, senior high school uh, boys and girls uh, will have some opportunities for enrichment as well. Um, and a lot of the teams and a lot of the opportunities are also aligned with the things that are taking place um, in our classrooms already with our integration of technology uh, and STEAM. Um, I'm particularly interested in the 4-8 uh, Dungeons and Dragons epic fantasy class. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I, I look forward to that. I live with one of those currently who's 14 years old. I literally said to myself, really Dungeons and Dragons? Oh, it's popular. Oh, no, it's your oh, sure oh, yes. oh, What's wrong with Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, this slide which shows the 6-8 experiences and the 9-12 experiences um, um, is, is really nice and I, I'm really looking forward to uh, beginning registration, uh, promoting uh, the opportunity. Uh, it'll run from uh, July 5th to July 15th in session one and then July 18th through July 29th. 
so those, those will be our uh, relationship with SCOPE. And then uh, the following week, we still, uh, we're working uh, with uh, Kidoyo uh, to provide opportunities and experiences uh, the first and second week of August, August uh, to continue our relationship and extension of what's taking place in our classrooms. So that's, uh, that's the, the broad kind of brush of uh, summer enrichment uh, 2022. Um, being, uh, taking kind of a, a lead in organizing it uh, last summer and then being asked to facilitate uh, opportunities uh, for this summer, I can't tell you how super excited I am um, for um, what's to come. I really think it's gonna be great. Um, there are uh, well over a dozen schools across Long Island uh, that have partnered with SCOPE for uh, decades. And uh, I think we're really going to reap the rewards. And our kids, our boys and girls, are going to be the beneficiaries. Uh, Excellent. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? No, that's great. What about Dr. Christie? Why is the second session closed for online? What's that? Oh, yeah, because so July 4th falls on a Monday. So this first session is uh, nine days, and the second session is 10 days. Um, so uh, you'll see a uh, $15 uh, difference between the two sessions uh, to make up for the fact that there's nine days in the first session and 10 days in the second session. Dr. Christie, can a kid sign up for the same thing in two sessions? You know, let's say like uh, Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah, Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> session, and Dungeons and Dragons. Absolutely. Yeah, they certainly can. The, um, it says that this is a sub the course is subsidized by the American Rescue Plan. Yeah. How many years do we expect that we'll be able to offer this? Yeah, so the, uh, so I, I, um, our goal is to grow into it long term. So uh, rather than, uh, uh, for instance, rather than subsidizing the entire program, uh, and, then it, and then three years from now there being a cost associated we, we thought it would make sense to strike the right balance. So this year, um, the cost is $189 and $195. So we decided um, to offset that uh, cost. So this year will be $100 and $115. As we move into next year, we, you know, obviously we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, but maybe it's $120 and $135, we're not quite certain, you know, what we can uh, support and finance. Uh, through the American Rescue Plan for uh, 2023. Uh, but then it'll also give us two years of data. We'll know how many boys and girls um, participate, uh, take advantage of it, and then, um, you know, uh, based on what we see this year and next year, we can start the long-term planning. If this is something that uh, the Board of Education wants to continue to sustain and grow and support, um, you can, you know, we can continue to build a portion of it into our general fund in 2024. Uh, with that said, if you look at some of the districts, if you go on the SCOPE website and you look at some of the districts that um, uh, ask parents to uh, fund the entire cost, you're looking at between uh, $200 and $230 per session, um, and that's the full cost to a parent without any subsidy whatsoever from the district. So I think we're, we're in a smart place right now. Uh, with offsetting the cost of about half, about you know half the cost, and then kind of grow into it as we go. Thank you. And still gives us an opportunity for partnerships with Kidoyo, for instance, this summer. Yeah. Nice, it's a nice offering, of course. Yeah, really great. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are now on to the business section. We will be doing the budget, pre wow. the budget presentation for the Central Office Salaries and Benefits Tax Cap and the Impact on the ESM Taxpayer. Mr. Lowey. It is, right? I'm usually fast. Well, thank you, Mr. President of the Board of Education, Mr. Steinhoff. Mr. All right, folks, uh, we're winding down here as we go through our budget presentation process. This is the uh, last presentation where we're presenting portions of the expenditure side of the budget. Of course, we will be looking at uh, the revenue side of the budget as well. So, like we do uh, for every presentation, we look at tonight's agenda, we're going to look at curriculum, transportation, central office, salaries, and benefits. And then finally, revenue through the tax caps. 
where we've been so far, January 26, February 9th, these meetings, these are the parts of the budget we hit. And then going forward, April 13th, we'll come back, we'll do a revenue and expenditures review, and the Board of Ed will vote on the proposed budget for next year. May 4th will be a budget hearing, our uh, state mandated budget hearing for the public. And then May 17th, the community vote for, uh, for the budget. All right, curriculum. I'm going to reach out to Mr. Steiner. So, um, one of the main things that we were taking a look at with regard to building this budget um, was to what do we need to keep in place to maintain uh, what we have, what we are currently working on. So that was really the goal as we headed as, as we headed to this school year. So um, we are working at the elementary level on our literacy, math, and social studies. We're going to continue the curriculum development. There. There's a lot of hard work that's going on um, with our elementary school teachers and our curriculum writing teams. Um, we are going to introduce curriculum development in science, digital literacy, and computer science. There are new state standards that are coming down with regard to uh, digital literacy. Um, there's next generation science standards that are uh, uh, that are coming out. I, I know we, I spoke to Mr. Fox a little bit about this. So those new state exams that are coming out. Uh, for example, living environment is now switching back to biology. Um, Earth science is earth science and space, I believe. Um, we are looking at our full implementation at the elementary school of our, and, and, this, and this budget puts in place with our K through five. Um, it was mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, the rollout of that, it, also with our outdoor and mental education program, that we didn't do it all at once, we did certain grade levels. I believe the last grade level, um, what do we do, fifth grade next year? Four. Uh, fourth, they didn't release, right? For the science 21? Yes, yeah, so fifth grade will be implemented in September. September, okay. okay. So fifth grade uh, will be uh, new to the uh, fifth grade students and the teachers. They'll get training in that, as well as, uh, you know, having a plethora of uh, outdoor education next year. And we'll look to add in K and three the following year in outdoor education. Um, that's attending, um, that's working closely with uh, post, uh, BOCES and uh, you know, visiting uh, Sunken Meadow, Caleb City, Smith State Park, et cetera. We're gonna look to enhance it, um, our STEAM and makerspace initiatives. Um, I'll talk about that in, in a, well, I guess I could, I could talk about that a little bit now. Uh, not only are we looking to add in um, equipment and manipulatives, et cetera. We saw some of them uh, in the presentation from our technology, uh, during our technology presentation. Uh, but we're also looking to add uh, two STEAM teachers uh, to our program next year to continue that enhancement of uh, what's happening. Uh, and you saw the boys and girls presenting at the high school level, and the goal would be, um, boys, you know, are the younger students having this hands-on opportunity and we'll have this whole area filled up with students that are doing research. Um, and that would be the goal, you know. So we had, you know, we've had seven or so uh, students shining. Um, you know, let's get, you know, 50 students shining. And uh, hopefully they get that bulk at the, you know, at the elementary level. Um, and you can just see from that one, you know, little video, the excitement of actually having that hands-on uh, enrichment experience. So uh, that, that's, that's part of this. Um, we're going to continue curriculum down to ensure uh, the alignment with the, the uh, state standards, uh, revised regents exams, we've kind of chatted about that a little bit already, expand the integration of online textbooks to meet the increased expectation of students. We have our Chromebooks. Instead of purchasing um, the old five pound textbook, we're looking to make use of the uh, Chromebook. Um, and the boys and girls box will be in better shape from not having all those books loaded in their backpacks. Uh, we're going to provide the best professional development to enhance instructional practices related to uh, writing workshop and uh, performance-based assessments so, and social emotional learning with uh, um, all, the, all the things that we're doing with Covey and the Seven Habits. And we're going to offer programs and learning experience to students that target research, critical thinking, and computer science skills, which you got to see uh, some of that. So we continue to expand in that area. All right, on to the slides that show the line-by-line -line parts of the budget. Uh, curriculum writing, 
Uh, actually, we're uh, running a, a, um, a large part of the, our curriculum running budget through ARP next year. And uh, overall, our curriculum budget is down 3%, and largely because we're, uh, we're utilizing our ARP money to the maximum that we can this year. So before you get to so anyone have any questions regarding the curriculum aspect? It's it's interesting too. Like we've talked about this this this, this grant money is coming up with things like American Rescue Plan. It's challenging to figure out. You know, schools are you know we can always use money for programs and, and, and uh, a variety of things for the students. But the way that that comes out, it's almost it's like one shots because you can you know one of the things we were. Uh, told early on is you have to be very careful. Like if you put a program in place that has to do with an employee, you're hiring somebody, that money runs out at the end of the three years. So something like curricular where the employees can be hired, work on, get a project done, and then continue to use it for years and facilitate lessons with the students is one way to go. So it's really a, a good way to do it. Otherwise, if you hire somebody, you only have their salary out of that for three years. And then, you know, if you hire 10 people, are you letting them go in 10 years? And is the program done? So it's, it's uh, interesting how we've had to figure out how to navigate it over the last couple years. So that's a, a great area to, to use that money in transportation. Transportation, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> this transportation cost will decrease actually 0.08% to 4,570,000. Next slide, come back only the yellow bus. Next slide. Uh, and the way we're able to hold our costs uh, about at, at uh, where they were from this year is we're actually consolidating a route, which uh, it's, a, it's one of our would be a seven hour route, which is as you see in a few moments, a seven hour route is about eighty two thousand uh, dollars. We also are uh, reducing a little bit of our contingency money. Uh, Built into the budget, we built in contingency money for special ed and homeless uh, Vicky and Mento uh, routes. We have 20 vans projected for special education. Five vans and one full size bus are projected to be used for private parochial schools. Four vans are projected for complying with McKinney Mento that's transporting our homeless students to and from Eastport South Manor. And appropriate transportation for the special ed work experience program. OCCTE classes and ENL summer transportation. And of course, provides for late buses at 3 30, 4 30, and 5 30 p.m. Right, here's our breakdown. So, uh, that first chart at the top is our core bus service, and that lists out the number of buses we're projected to use for next year for seven hour, six hour, five hour, four hour buses on our five hour and six hour events. That's how many routes we'll run, and the length of a bus route uh, for seven hour buses, how long will we be in that bus for the day? Longer route, obviously, the more hours we need that bus. And then the in district special ed vans, that's for special ed, uh, transport special ed students who live in district and are coming to our school. Next slide is out of district special ed vans, that's uh, for students that are being transported to uh, schools outside of the district. Uh, and then bus aids, that's for uh, staff that are on the buses to help. Uh, help with our transportation of our special ed students. Our private parochial runs, our work experience, our work experience program, and ENL summer program cost, and then finally our McKinney Mento routes that we're running. So all in all, brings it in at about we're actually reducing costs three thousand six hundred and ninety eight dollars. Okay. <clears throat> Two questions for you. One, I know that we're contractually obligated for the 4.5, almost 4.6. Um, do we have any wiggle room? Because with the rising of gas prices, I, I'm pretty sure that the, uh, actually it should be just one question, it looks like it's all entwined. Are we worried about the contract going up, regardless of the fact that, you know, I know it's a signed contract, but I know with the cost of living going up, can the contract itself go up, contract cost? 
Well, the contract we currently have with Montauk Bus calls for our rate increase to be married to CPI, or as the state says, the transportation CPI is for us next year. So it's our wages, whatever CPI is, and half of that. So if CPI comes in at 6%, we're at 3 And we're capped at 3 Our contract also calls for the highest we can go up is 3%. So if it comes in at 8%, inflation keeps going up, and it's 8 9%, we're paying 3%. Capped at three. Comes at 4%, we're paying two. This budget's built at 3%. So if gas prices continue to climb or stay where they are and come back down, the vendors are on the hook for that. And now, now, my next question leads, in, leads from that. I know they did it to William Floyd. Do we have a contingency plan, God forbid, that they decide that they want to opt out because it's not? If a, if a vendor opts out of a contract, we would have to go, we'd have. To either A, go out to bid, go out to RFP, and try to find another vendor, we're taking our chances on the market, or we can contract with BOCES. Okay. Now, BOCES' contract is with Montauk Bus. I'll turn that. It goes around. Yeah. 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 Mr. Lowry, the, um, the 3, 30, 4, 30, 5, 30 bus routes that were restored back in, I guess, two years ago. The utilization of that, um, have we had any complaints that we have empty buses running? Uh, the 530 buses aren't as utilized as heavily as the 430 buses. The 430 buses are well used. Okay. Uh, we, the 530 buses, uh, students do use our athletes are using them, uh, but definitely not as much as the 430 buses. Have we consolidated any of those routes based on no, the utilization? No, well, we have, we're running for a day because uh, it's, Large district. We are the third largest geographic district. Really so, so. Uh, no, four. No, when he said four, at some point we, yeah. we have more than four. Our challenge is actually is they're still struggling with drivers. So on some days we'll have for the 3:30 bus we might have uh, three buses show up. The 4:30 bus will show up with all four. The 5:30 bus. And usually the later it is, the more we'll get our full complement of buses. The challenge for the, the, the vendor right now is to get the buses here for the 3:30 run. So they'll consolidate around when that happens. That means a little longer for those kids to get home, which then can happen. That bus will have a little bit longer to get back at 4.30. And that one year, that was a blip um, where we didn't have these buses or a full complement of buses. Um, at this point, the state aid is now still is flowing in for them because we're about two years. Yeah, we're, we're well past that. Then. And what is our state, uh, what's the state aid ratio? Does that change versus CPI on transportation? No, it's a standard for us. And so even if inflation changes, the state doesn't give us a little more money? I wish they would. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? All right. Munich's. Next up, central office. Uh, so this is going to be broken down into different parts of central office. The first part is right here, Board of Education and District Clerk. Not too much of a change there. Superintendent's office. Changes there for our contractual supply lines. Business office. Uh, I am up ten thousand dollars in my thirteen ten four ninety, and that's for Syntax, our public relations company. We are down almost nine thousand dollars in our central printing contractual and our sixteen seventy four hundred. We actually purchased. We were able to purchase two postage machines this year as opposed to. This next year and long term. I'm, 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 gonna jump in. I'm sorry. I just received something from Syntax. I'll share with you uh, Friday. It talks about all the work that they've done. But sometimes it's one of those things you're like, what did they actually do? So it's kind of a mid year report on all the things that they've worked on uh, for us this school year. And, and, um, and there's more to come. We have newsletters, more information. It's, it's us getting more information. Yeah, they, and, and, you know, as you know, they pumped out a lot for us during um, the bond and giving a look at the bond. So it, it, it has a lot of information. Were there any fees associated with the bond? Like, did they so it's actu actually interesting you say that. One of the things that they have now as an add-on um, is if a school district is going to have a bond, there's an additional fee. So they learned the lesson with us. Yeah. Yeah. We utilize them quite a bit. Yes, we do. Yeah, I know they made me sound smarter when they came down to write letters yeah. to go upstate. Yeah. So. No, they do a great job. 
debt service and tax anticipation notes. This is the part of our budget uh, where we're paying off our mortgage, if you will. And also our TAN, which we borrow every year, we help our cash flow. 85% of the schools and stuff can't use a TAN. And, uh, down a little bit there, because as we pay off principal, our interest goes down. That service of 10 represents 13% of our operating budget. Personnel department. And then on there, oh, any questions about that portion? Uh, I just want to say thank you for uh, working so diligently over these at least three years out of here to, keep, to make sure our interest rates have been dropping for us. Um, well, our business office takes great pride in, in getting our interest rates down. And timing the considering the timing of the loans that pay the least amount we can. Mr. Lobby, one one question, I'm sorry. 601, 9701, 601, and 701, that's all with the energy performance contract? Past EBCs, yes. Past EBCs. Not not the new one. Not we, the new we, one. Haven't, we haven't taken out mine to that yet. Okay. Salary and benefits. Okay, we'll start with salary. District-wide salaries will, will increase just over $1.5 million, or 3.3%, to $48,334,029.44. Salaries make up 46.5% of our proposed operating budget for next year. And in our salary budget, what we're at, three additional special education teachers, which uh, will address the grades, three, the grades three through six inclusion program will now be staff with full-time special education teachers at Dayton Avenue and Eastport Elementary Schools. Uh, additional 1211 self-contained class for grades three through six at Dayton Avenue School included. This aligns our special education programs between the elementary and high school. Two new elementary school teachers dedicated to our STEAM enrichment program. Uh, the STEAM enrichment initiative, Mr. Steinmel mentioned this before. One plus teacher at our K through two buildings and a world language plus ELL director. Also, a unified basketball coach. And some of this we talked about in an earlier presentation with our athletics department from uh, back in February. Girls flag football coach, four varsity assistant coaches for boys and girls basketball and volleyball. Junior high coaches for additional teams with softball and boys and girls soccer. Three new clubs at the high school for uh, junior senior high school for coding, dance, that does at the four metric junior high school, junior senior high school. Funding for our transportation coordinator. Uh, this is a new addition to the school district. Currently, we have one person who manages purchasing and transportation. Now, 10 years ago, this was bought when uh, it was listed in our budget as a 0.4 FTE for transportation and a 0.4 FTE for purchasing, and then a 0.2 for general clerical. Uh, transportation. The requirements, state reporting for transportation, and just the bare purchasing over the years has increased, 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 where this one person really cannot manage to do this and get it done effectively every year. It really begins to hurt us in the purchasing area, where we're not. We could, we could vet things better, pursue an RPs better, and just, I think, save us more money in the long run by adding this provision. So having a dedicated person to transportation will definitely help out additional customer service for our parents and our students who are using our buses and our principals who deal with those calls, trying to take some of that off their plate so they can work more with our students and staff in the building. But I think this position will go a long way to helping us be better all around. All right, salary uh, breakdown. This is the first of three slides. Uh, this is a, this is a um, uh, we take all of our salary budget codes, and our, and our budget is maybe nearly 500 lines of, of uh, account codes. I'm consolidating all the salary lines into general areas so we can do apples to apples when we look from year to year. So those are the salary total. You saw the general salary total earlier. And our total, there's a 3.3% at the bottom on the right. Uh, benefits, the benefits side of the budget. Additional right benefits are projected to increase 3.1% to just over $19.5 million. The TRS rate will increase 4.7% from the year before. That's the amount difference between what TRS is this year to next year. I'll show you a chart for that in just a second. TRS rates will actually decrease in tiers three and four, five, and six. 
Local retirement costs are projected to, uh, to be increasing about 12%. And benefits up, uh, comprises about 19% of our proposed operating budget for next year. Together, salary and benefits, because that's what the number of the state will be asking the schools to report on, whether your salaries or benefits, salary and benefits for us represents about 65% of our budget. Now, we are a business of people teaching people. We're not making widgets, we're not a factory, we're not automated, we are humans working with humans. That's why our salary and benefits is a large portion of our budget. probably heard a lot, I think I mentioned earlier in the year, uh, health insurance costs went up a lot for school districts across the state. Uh, for our family costs, uh, for family plans, it went up 12.7% for 20, 2022. Uh, so that, the nice shift budget runs from, uh, uh, runs a different calendar year than ours. Our budget year runs from July 1 through June 30th. Nice shift's budget calendar runs from January 1st to December 31st. So this is the, we already know our cost increase for the first half of this year, the, uh, was 12.7 percent. We project next year for what we think will be. Right now, we're building for 12 percent for next year. It's going to be high again. That's what all the prognosticators are calling for us. Right now, we saw our health insurance cost for us for the family plan. This is not this before. It's divided up between the different bargaining units pay different amounts for their health insurance. It went from 29 and a half thousand to uh, just over 33,000 this year. It's actually one of the larger increases in the last 20 years for my ship. You see, this actually makes budgeting very tough. When you have wild swings like this, uh, where just a couple of years ago we were at 12.17% and it dropped it, 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 all the way down to actually health insurance went down a few dollars. It was, it was a negative number. It was the first time in the 50 year history, I understand, of night shift where health insurance costs actually went down. And then with COVID costs, our you know, insurers, they're, they're eating a lot of they're starting to pass that on to the school districts. Yeah, 18, 19, 20. Hopefully. Hopefully it doesn't uh, go over 12.7. You know, uh, when, I, when I talk to my counterparts, we're all planning for a, a, at least one more drop here. Uh, I had mentioned before about TRS rates. TRS rates now, uh, teacher retirement system and ERS, employee retirement system, teacher retirement system with teachers and administrators, ERS is everybody else, whether you work for a school district, a county, or a town. Uh, I'm focusing on TRS right now it's, uh, because it's just one group ERS, it's multiple tiers, as I mentioned earlier. Our, uh, the TRS rate for us goes up 10.29%. So what does that mean? For every dollar that someone's paid who is a member of TRS, the district has to send 10.29 cents up to Albany. So what is that? And then employees play into that, too. Depending on what tier you are, you might have paid your first 10 years in your tier 4, or your tier 5 and 6, you're still paying in. So uh, all this money is sent up to Albany, and what do they do with it? They gamble it in Vegas. No, they actually do it on Wall Street. If they have a good year, that rate goes down. We pay less the next year or the next couple of years. If they have a bad year gambling in on Wall Street, then that rate goes up. Now, the, the anomaly here is the rate's going up the last couple of years despite the fact that the stock market's done pretty well. So when TRS went up this year, when everybody was expecting to go down, their excuse was, excuse their reasoning was that uh, uh, people are living longer and they're retiring with higher salaries, so we need to raise the rate on all of these school districts. So, what does that mean to us? It means the amount that we're paying to TRS goes up, so it's an increase for us that we had to absorb. Well, every one point that it goes up for us costs us about $440,000. And just a quick note, you look up there at 17.53% that wasn't all that long ago. If that was to happen today, we'd have to find about $3.6 million of additional funds just to pay that bill. That would be devastating to us. All right, our benefits breakdown. It's going to be first in two slides. Uh, that's all the benefits we pay in this the state retirement, Social Security, life insurance, uh, our unemployment insurance we pay, our night shift, our health insurance, our dental insurance, um, vision insurance. So these are all the things that the district pays for benefits to its district staff. Revenues and tax cap. I just got a quick one for you, uh, and then I'll pass it around. If you go back to salaries under teaching assistants, it, it, of all the ones that go up, I mean, I know we, we've settled a lot of contracts, but the, uh, they went up 150, almost 152%. Uh, 
teaching assistants, yes, uh, five, almost $560,000, because if we had to build into next year's budget, uh, we are in contractual negotiations with that unit, and we had built in what we expect to be our contractual obligation for next year. Uh, I was wondering if we are more of what we're looking at. Uh, we built the budget based on what we have now, projected for next year. Oh. Anyone else have questions? Go ahead. Ms. Lovion, um, on slide 26, it says that grade three, uh, what's the date? Grade three through six, additional 12 one one self contained class. Um, this aligns with our special education program. I just looked back at my notes from when Mr. Frank Lewis was here, and he said that there was going to be an additional one section of 12 of one one. So it's just, it's one section. It's not two sections now, right? No, it's one. It's one. It's one. So it just aligns with it. So right. So okay. and I, so that was a proposal. We're, we're locking in the salaries tonight in this presentation. So it's pulling that over to that spot. Okay. Then the six additional FTEs for the fifteen one one three four five and six. That's already there. Okay. So there's been no changes since Ms. Uh, Mr. Frank was special proposal. No. No. And we're just saying that so the right, budget includes. So right, right, correct. And okay. similar to the basketball coaches, like because we're doing salaries, we're allotting the, the money for the salaries tonight. And it's kind of a reminder. The additions tonight that you haven't seen yet are the ones on the bottom of the page, uh, which would be the additional plus teacher for the K2 buildings, the two STEAM teachers. The EL director. And the, and the ELL slash plus slash uh, world language director. Right. It's so as, for as you've seen, but the, you know, listen, the idea of the, of the proposals as, as the different, the administrators come in and present the budget, we'll, we're still crashing numbers together and, and, and seeing if we, if we propose this, um, but is this what we're going to do? Um, for instance, early, uh, I'll give you an example. Earlier tonight, um, Dr. Fulton was presenting and she talked about the anatomy cable. We took those funds and put that into a steam teacher. So we lost that team. Uh, I was well, actually we have a person. I was actually gonna ask about that because they mentioned it in the yeah. technology. So that is so that is a change where that is not in the budget, in the final budget, it didn't make the cut. We use those funds to put put towards uh staff money. No, it's a good good use of funds. Thank you. That's what we thought. Absolutely. So I guess just to clarify that, then the anatomage table is is out. That's out. It's out for this year. Not that we can't go for it next year, right. next year. Yeah. And we have a teacher now for it. Right. Well, look, I, th I think when you see the, um, you saw the presentation, you saw what's happening in Steam. I mean, we have, we want to also that and provide those enrichment programs. Yeah. <coughs> and then we also have the three to six inclusion program will be staffed still full time teachers instead of half day teachers. Correct. So that was one of the things we want. You know, keep it up with this process a proposal that we wanted to get in place. And um, unless something crazy comes out, if the state still hasn't passed and approved its budget, um, all all signs are indicating whatever that means. Uh, pretty much what they presented is what we're going to get. So unless there's all of a sudden a cut, all of those things may be through. All those proposals may be through. Thank you. Revenues in the tax cap. So, to fund our budget, to fund all our expenditures, we have to raise revenue. Our revenue comes from three distinct pools. Local revenue, state aid, and the tax levy. This chart, uh, the top chart there, maps out what percentage of each we get from each bucket, if you will. Local revenues are pilot payments we get, payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, we have a new one coming on the books this year, we're gonna talk about that in a second. Uh, tuition payments we get from East Merchants, Remsenburg, other schools who send their children here, and, uh, and any, any amount of uh, the reserves that we're using in a budget year. And actually, we will be doing some of that this year. Then state aid represents 37% of our revenues, and then the tax levy, that's the amount of money that we get from our community members. And that's just under 58%. All in all, we're looking at a revenue side of our budget of uh, almost $104 million. Walk through it. Uh, 
First, just a couple of budget notes on the, that uh, address the local revenue side, which are uh, the utilization of reserves. We're going to talk about that a little bit here. Uh, ESM is utilizing just over 1.6 million reserve funds to repair roofs at the high school and South Street School. Now, these funds have been budgeted in our 22-23 budget as a transfer to capital expenditures. Now, we have to state that publicly because that allows us to uh, submit this project to the state and we will get state aid on it. Uh, the repairs will be reimbursed by the state and ESM will receive just about 75% of that, $1.2 million over the next 15 years is building aid. So that project, this, this, these roof repairs that we're planning to do next year, will end up only costing us several hundred dollars instead of $1.6 million. Uh, we will also be utilizing $1 million of reserve funds to offset one-year spike in increases, which some of those in the benefit section we just showed you. I want to talk about that right after I do this bullet. Uh, ESM is also appropriating $500,000 in projected fund balance from this year's budget, funding will finish for this year, to help fund next year's operating budget. And that's to offset a two-year drop in state building aid, which when I get to the state building aid slide, I'm going to talk about that. So, in general, this is, in my, this is now my fifth budget I've put together here. This is the first time in five years that we've gone into reserves. And one of the things that Don Fox is a uh, member of the budget committee here, and we've talked frequently about a term we call being good little chipmunks and putting our acorns away when times are good. So we have them when the winter comes and times are bad. So the last couple of years, we've been able to put money away <coughs> next year every year for when times are bad. So this year, with the economy the way it is, with inflation, uh, this is the time to use it. Your options are you can utilize reserve when times get bad, or you can cut expenditures. We get you know, staff, we get cuts to the budget, or you can ask the taxpayers for more. And those last two I just said aren't exactly appealing to people, but we build up our reserves so we can utilize them when times like this to offset a one-year spike in health insurance and TRS, those type of things that in future years when they return to normal will be well will be within our budget. One last analogy, if you permit me. Sure. The economy comes in waves. Well, like nature. Nature is a wave, right? So when times are good, we're up here, top of the wave, we're putting money away. When times are bad, down here, we're going to be utilizing some of the money. The economy is nuts. It goes like this all throughout our lives. We want our community, our taxpayers, our staff, our students to feel this nice and steady. We don't want to rock the boat. That's why we put it away when we have it, we use it when we don't. And they generously said yes. Put those monies on the taxpayer would be your responsibility. Also, with the, the 1.6 for the, the roof repairs, we're getting that 1.2 for it. And if we had a borrow, like let's say if we took out like a, instead of a TAN, we took out a, a, you know, a, another note, anticipatory note, we still have to pay interest on that. So it's nice that we have the funds to cover that to pay it out, get the money back over the next 15 years. It's not like we're really spending the 1.6. We don't have a choice for doing the roof. If we had to, if we were in a in a bad spot where we didn't have the money, we'd have to borrow to do that. That is correct. You know, and and we talked about a pan, right? The, what's the other one? We have the tax anticipation. Tax anticipation of the tan. A pan is a bond, a pan. which which we'll be talking about later on this year. All right, bond. The money coming. But we'd end up having to do the same thing because we're going to have to borrow and access that money. So that, that's why it's, this is extremely important. I mean, we, I, I used to say it all the time, we have three primary functions hire a superintendent, make policy, and probably our most important is to put together a fiscally responsible budget. And I know for the three years I've been here, we, we have busted our rear ends to make sure that that happens. And I know prior to getting on, we were climbing out of some big holes. So, you know. You guys should be proud of yourselves. So those of us who've been on this ride for three years and the two, the three new people, you'll see it's not a lot of fun at times, but you keep going at it and trust what you're working with. So and the key is we're utilizing our reserves for one or possibly two year spikes to offset. You don't want to use your reserves to fund things that happen year after year after year. Because that's how you quickly burn down your reserves and end up in a place where you can't afford to operate anymore. You just allow these been there. Two point one in reserves, in reserves. Yeah. including all the codes, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah reserves were two point one million, and the, the, the fund balance was two point one million. It's four point, a little under four point two total. Thank God the Gulf Stream those years did not blow our roof off. No, 
Not sure. That's the, one of the sayings we always say here. We have reserves for when the roof blows off. So did you just say the table? Just to clarify, in case anyone, I, I, I believe we might have said it the last meeting. I could be wrong. 1.6 is to fix the flat parts of the roof. So yeah, it's not part of the bond. Yes, yeah. not the angular parts. And the reason we're doing it this way is because we wouldn't be able to get this roof fixed in time before the bond, because the bond project will take effect for a couple of years, but we need to get these fixed sooner because our EPC, our solar panels, will go up in this place here. So this is a timing issue here. So this is where we maximize our revenue on the EPC when that starts. Correct. And the other thing to note, because I, I know there's not a lot of people attending the facilities committee meetings, but, you know, I want to think so, if you just look at the square area of the roof, there, there's a lot more that goes into the roof. I mean, Mr. O'Connor told us very, you have, you have all the walls up top, there's masonry work, there's flashing, there's waterproofing. It's not just, you know, going up there with buckets of tar and putting it down. It's a lot of these areas um, have a lot more going on. So money well spent. All right, this slide shows our state aid. Now there's been a lot of the news, especially last year when uh, Governor Hall said and the state we're gonna fully fund foundation aid for the school districts. So that's that top line, foundation aid, right there. We're getting a, we're seeing a nine hundred thousand dollar increase. The rest of these lines here, with the exception of building aid, which I'll get into in just a second, are ex, are expense driven aids. The more you use them, the more aid you get back. So we're seeing a drop in a couple of those lines. High cost, excess cost, down a quarter million dollars. Well, that's our that's for lack of a better term, that's our special ed aid. The more special ed you're running, the more aid you get back. We see a drop off because when these this aid was calculated for us, our special aid numbers were down. Now in the last eight, nine months, our special aid numbers are up. That number doesn't reflect that yet. And that number, as it was explained to you by our state officials up in Albany, is very fluid. That could very well change and probably will change as next year goes through. So as we get, we receive money in the high cost, excess cost line, we'll do better than the $702,901 that's there. So how do you budget for that? You budget with only the number they give you now because we don't know what it will be. But we expected to do better next year. Then, in the building aid line, you'll see we're down just over a half million dollars of building aid. That's quite a bit. When we first got our numbers, uh, we were a little surprised at that, so we had to do some thinking. Why is this happening? Because building aid should stay steady as the years go on, unless you're adding debt service, as we will be in a couple of years. So uh, we found out that about 20 years ago, uh, before the district merged into Eastport, into Eastport South Manor, was just Eastport South Manor. Uh, the way money was borrowed back then and funded by the state was done differently than it is today. Back then, when a school district uh, had a project approved by NYSEN, state aid started flowing immediately so that the state would start funding the project. They'd send checks that budget year. Back then, 20 years ago, the East Coast School District did take out a loan to start the debt service for another two budget cycles. So they started getting funded on a 20 year project, 20 payments, 20 years of payments. That year, they took out the loan. I mean, that, that year they launched the project, but they didn't start paying off the loan for another two budget years. And they were going to make 20 budget payments. So they don't align. So they got two years of aid payments and then finished. We got a fully funded 20 years of aid, but we still have two more eight, uh, debt service payments to make on that note. So that's $500,000 we're down this year building it. This district was fully funded over 20 years. We got it state aided. But we still have two more years of debt service to make. Now, so, look, the, the, the rules are changed on that, so the bond that we just took out, we don't so, have any of the money now, We're not going to see it for a year and a half, so we'll match up to the building. In 2011, the state changed the rule. When a project is approved by the state, the aid doesn't start flowing right away. It's a, there's an 18 month delay. So by the time you start paying debt service, your aid arrives. So they, they line up perfectly, so you don't, this can't happen again. So are we going to see at 514,000 as a negative? Well, next year, we'll, it'll stay constant in the year after that, it'll just jump back up to? No, the, the, the aid number wouldn't jump up, our debt service will drop down. So we'll see it on the, on the next So it'll be a plus to the community, but it should be wanted to be. I understand. So basically, the hit's just one year, though. Studios, so, we'll so, okay. so for this year to offset that, we appropriate, we're appropriating $500,000 of fund balance, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, from 
we expect to finish this year with, we're using it for next year. That wouldn't be a budget practice we would want to do annually because you, you, you can't guarantee that you can finish any one year with enough fund balance to fund, us, to fund something you need to fund in the next year's budget. So we'll do this for the next two years, and then that pay, that'll be done, and we'll move on. Again, you don't want to use your reserves or appropriate fund balance in a permanent fashion. It's an offset spikes, roof blowing off, health insurance going crazy, No, when the districts merged, they assumed each other's, they got married. Okay. Yes. Oh wait, we're not borrowing, Mr. Lowe, we're not borrowing from the reserve to fund that. No. We're, this year's fund. We're taking money that we'll project that we'll finish with this year. Instead of putting it in movies. Yeah, yeah. It, if we didn't have to do that, we would put that into reserves at the end of the year. But we're not pulling out of the reserve per se what we have right now. Exactly. It's going to limit what we can put in. It's limiting what we're putting in. Okay. So even if we if we just said we were taking it out now, then in June or July, will we close the books? August, September, we get a report. We put it in. Now we'll just be putting less five hundred. Okay. So then we don't have to transfer that money out. Okay. The tax cap, the portion, this is the portion of our revenues that comes from our taxpayers, our community members. Uh, this is the actual formula. There's uh, the top there. You'll see a fifty-eight million three hundred forty-seven thousand dollar number. That's the amount of the tax levy we're getting from taxpayers in this year. You start the formula with that. You multiply it by the tax base growth factor. I get you lost on this, so I'll try not to. You multiply it by the tax base growth factor, which is set by the state. Uh, then you back out the, the uh, you add in the pilot. Now the pilot is important here because we're getting a new pilot this year. That number you see up there, seven hundred thirty-three thousand dollars and change. That's money we get from the federal government for Brookhaven National Lab. That's been a standard for us. We get usually between seven thirty and seven hundred forty thousand dollars every year. Um, you'll see lower down uh, estimated pilot that's coming in for next year is nine hundred seventeen thousand. You have to back that number out. That's because we're getting in an additional. Uh, about 170, excuse me, 187 thousand dollars next year in money for the new solar farm that's been built just up the road here. So a pilot for that. The town negotiated that with the landowner, and that's our cut. So that's good for the taxpayer because that's money that comes to us. We get it, but that means it's less we have to ask taxpayers for. So if that money didn't come. Our proposed tax levy increase of 2.88 percent at the bottom right there really would have been about 3.2 percent. Uh, let me ask you, because that's a pilot. Now, if we end up getting, if the budget goes through for the state, and we end up getting the money for the Pine Barrens, does that play in this year, or does it have to wait till next year? My understanding is that wouldn't come as a pilot, that would come as a revenue source for us. Okay. So we wouldn't, it wouldn't enter into this formula, it would just be one of our revenues. You, you could right. eventually, argument say we could put this budget together, and then you could end up with extra money coming from the state that Absolutely. So I haven't budgeted that in because it hasn't passed the budget yet. Yes. Well, yeah, kind of, sort of. <laughs> so far, it seems like everything's on track to pass on time. I hope so. I talked enough. I talked enough. So, so the, the big number here is our. I'm sorry, what, where are areas that are not really the big numbers anymore as other than the time is so our tax cap limit, it's at 2% this year. That's the highest they can be for New York State. And then after we run it through our formula, our tax levy is tax cap compliant at 2.88%. Where that stands in the history of ESM, since 2005, 2006, is uh, you can see we trend downwards. We're pretty much in a sweet spot where we've been the last couple of years in terms of an increase. Uh, historically, in the seven years before the tax cap law went to effect in 2011, 2012, our, our Typical increase average was 4.65%. Since the tax cap law is going to affect, it's about 2.49%. So that means we get about 2% less out of the tax levy because the law caps us on how much we can ask for, 2% less a year. With each percent representing about $600,000 of a levy, we're talking about the district is getting, it's getting by with 1.2 million less a year. And we operate every year. But we ask less and less from the taxpayers on average than we did in the past.
and we're still good school. Uh, the local revenues, we talked about this in quite detail before. There is the reserve use, the 2.6 million. That's the, uh, the money we're tapping the reserves for the roof and to offset one year spikes and then appropriated pump balance. There's that $500,000 to offset the drop in building that we saw. At the top, there's the tuition that we're receiving from other school districts. We have to take a good guess who will be here next year. I'm trying to get down a little bit. So enrollments are dropping in school districts across the East End. Uh, our pilot, you see that goes up $4,000 because there was a little fluctuation in the Brookhaven side of that. Um, and then our Medicare reimbursements, the TAN refund we get, interest and earnings. And that represents the local share of our budget. Not really we're around $2 million, but since we're going to reserves this year, the numbers higher. And that's that. Questions? So, um, for this year, with the state aid, is it actually being funded 100%? Not yet. Almost there. Next year, will get us through it. There's a formula to calculate for foundation. Now, state aid is a bunch of different categories. Yeah, foundation, is that part, that's the one they're always talking about, funding at 100%. So that's the one they use a formula based on uh, demographics or your community and need. And they figure out this is what we have to give it. They never funded it fully for all school districts, I'm sure. So, Just a second. So at the end of next year, we'll, the state is saying they will fully fund. The second part is, is the formula accurate? All well, see, that, which is a whole other thing, like all the schools getting what they should, is the formula doing what it should be doing? Well, that's what I was looking at. I know we don't have control over that. Yeah, the 2021 to 2022 handbook came out, and that if you look at the um, the P and I, the pupil needs index, right? So. It seems like you know Long Island and New York City is lumped together at that 1.4. The lowest is one. The highest could be two. But all they have to do is change that number a little bit, and it skews the entire yep. state aid. So they could say, yeah, we're funding it 100 percent, but oh, by the way, we change your pupil needs index. And I'm just wondering if they have projections on that. Like, how do they come up with that, or did they just pick that out of a hat? From dice. I'm hoping they're not picking. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like, you know, it looks great in the papers when you're saying you're funding it 100%. Yeah, they're funding it 100% based on the formula that they're putting together. And they could change a little bit. So I just, you know, it's important for everyone on the board and the community to realize when they say, oh, well, we're funding, we're not, it doesn't mean a boatload of money's coming in. It just means that they're gonna hold, tr hold true to their formula, which they change every year. And I, and I also, if I remember correctly, when, when they put this in stating when Governor Cuomo initiated the paying it off, they were talking three years, but there's a chance, there's always that small chance that this is it, and next year they're like, well, we don't have the money, so we can't do it. You know, they, they say they're going to do it, but there's always a chance, because they've been talking about doing this for years upon years, and then it's always pushed to the wayside. We give you what we can give you, and that's the best we can do. Yeah. You know, it just, it kills me because... As much as they say, oh, they're going to do it, they're going to fund this, they're in control of the formula, which actually, in the end, tells you how much you're getting. So they can, the yep. formula can change just a little bit. I mean, our local, what's the local tax factor in the formula? Is the tax base growth factor, which is a part of the formula nobody ever talks about. Newsday always runs a front page story saying, oh, it's 2%, whatever it's going to be. They never talk about the, the tax base growth factor, which is set up new brick and mortar in your community. And it can wildly swing. Last year, that part of the formula. See the tax base growth factor at 1.0 to 9% generated. It added $169,000 onto what we can ask taxpayers for. Yeah. Last year, that number was a lot higher. It was about $700,000. That, that's, that's what kills me. Like, oh, great, it's going to be all funded, all this money's coming in. But that's 1.0029, so it's 2.9% over the percent over. Right, but last year we were getting seven hundred thousand in there, exactly. and now it just went away. And they said they said that they come down, they take assessed values from the towns, and they look at what your what's what kind of building is going on. They let you calculate on that. But they said that for you. Yes. Oh yeah. So obviously we're going to have more construction. We're going to get more money versus a year that we have less construction. So it's variable in that sense. But the other thing that's variable about it is the assessed value because tax base growth. It's not just, yes, if you build more and the assessed value stays the same, but 
On Long Island, we've seen in the last 36 months, real estate values have gone through the roof. You would, you know, I would, I would assume that that tax base growth factor would be the tax base growing, and the tax base also has to do with your assessed value, just like they did in Nassau County about four years ago. Um, it's just very interesting to me that that came in so low this year. When you source, so you see it everywhere. Mr. Governor, you're, you, know, you know about real estate, and you know you would think that this year you would have been close to where we were last year. 733 last year, now we're at 169. It don't even says anything about that. But yet you see it every day. Sometimes it can be frustrating. Any more questions? Yes, All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't move yet. You might as well sit there for 10 seconds because I'm going to get to the serial bomb in case anybody's you know, going to go back to your, your office over there. Item two is a serial bond for alterations and improvements. This is the bond that we just voted on, that the community just voted on, correct? Correct. That is correct. Okie dokie. Can I have a motion for item number two? Motion. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, the bond resolution, we're authorizing the construction of additions, alterations, improvements to all district school buildings and the sites the estimated total cost thereof is not to exceed $89,979,320. say that like it's... All right, item three is the acceptance of the internal audit risk assessment report. I have a motion. Second. Anyone have any questions regarding this? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we accept the internal order risk assessment report for the period ending December 21st, 2021, which was reviewed by the District Audit Committee and submitted by R.S. Abrams & Company, LLP. Item four is the Treasurer's Report. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we just approved the Treasurer's Report for January of 2022. We are now on the personnel. Can I have a consent of agenda? Motion. Yes. All in favor? Okay. Resignations, we are at eight as listed. Leaves of absence, we're at seven as listed. Teacher appointments, we're at one. Appointments for permanent substitute teachers is at four. Appointments for per, per, per diem substitutes is two. And appointments for civil service is at home. We're at four, as listed. Interscholastic appointments, we are at two, as listed. Supplemental pay, we're at 14, as listed. Six period pay, one as listed. Class size overages, nine as listed. And we are now up to public participation. First invitation, this is the point where we talk about things that are on the agenda. Do we have anybody signed up? No? Okay. So we now, anybody have anything for old business? We're up to old business. No, okay, we're on to new business. This is so easy. Item one is notice of public hearing and budget vote. Can I have a motion? Second. Okay, uh, this is uh, this is set for the budget vote for uh, this year. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we approve the notice of public hearing and budget vote of the Eastport South Manor Central School District legal. Notice and di directs the district clerk to advertise same in the school district newspapers. Item two is a memorandum of agreement, the ESMTA. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we approve the memorandum of agreement with the Eastport South Minus Teachers Association regarding the 2022 2023 school calendar. Item three is a health and welfare service agreements. Can I have a motion? Any questions? 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we approve the health and welfare service contracts for the 2021-2022 school year with the following school districts. West Isle Union Free School District, South Huntington Union Free School District. Item four is a bypass of the RFP process for Dr. Carol Orris. I have a motion. All in favor? Aye. Uh, the district, we've just approved, the district is bypassing the RFP process and its purchasing policy so it can hire a, psych a psychological consultant provider that can provide specialized services to meet student needs. Uh, we just approved the special education service agreement with Dr. Carol Horace. Uh, item five is a bypass RFP process with Dr. Michael Schwartz. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The Board of Education is bypassing its purchasing policy and the New York State GML Purchasing Law and approved the contract with Michael Schwartz and DPC for the serving the district on an emergency basis for the 2021-2022 school year. Item six is a supplemental par supplemental agreement with Par Panorama Education. I have a motion. Any questions? All in favor? Uh, okay, we approve the supplemental agreement with Panorama Education. Item seven is the Scope Summer Enrichment Program Agreement. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. Any questions? Discussion. Go for it. So I read through the contract, um, and it made sense now with the rates uh, corresponding to what Dr. Christie was speaking of. Will Scope be providing any security personnel for the buildings that will be used during the summer? I do not know the answer to that question. I will find out for you. Okay. As a district, are we going to have security at those uh, buildings? We do have some, some uh, summer security. You have summer or security on uh, for Dayton. Yeah. yeah. Well, Dayton has ESPY. Yeah, this is a, this this is is a is sport, so we may have to add something. I'm not sure if they do it out. I'll find out. Okay. It's just, uh, when I was going through the, the miscellaneous yep. portions of here, it doesn't say that scope is requiring it, but I think as a board, we... We have uh, yeah, a district. Sort of place like we do normal. Yes, exactly. Thank okay. you. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we approve the summer enrichment program agreement with Scope Education Services for the 2022-2023 school year. Item 8 is obsolete equipment. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, we're declaring uh, listed equipment as being uh, obsolete. Item nine is an obsolete textbooks. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we're, we're textbook is the, the listed textbooks are being deemed obsolete. Uh, item 10 is to bypass the RFP process for Dr. Pierce Ferreter. For, for reader? Good luck with that. Ferreter? Ferreter. 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 Look at that. Ferreter. Thank God you're an English teacher. I'm so happy. Can I have a motion? Motion. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the Board of Education is bypassing its purchasing policy and the New York State GML purchasing will approve the contract with Dr. Pierce Ferreter, MD, for serving the district on an emergency basis for the 21-22 school year. Item 11 is a 913 examination. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The employee named in executive session referred to as employee A is hereby directed to appear for medical examination in the office of Dr. Pierce Federer. That, and it is re further resolved that Dr. Pierce Federer is hereby appointed school medical inspector pursuant to subsection 913 of the education law in order to evaluate said employee's ability to perform her duties as an aide. Uh, we are on to the student services. We are acknowledging accepting the decisions already made by the Committee on Special Education. Now we're on the policy. We're on the first reading for policy number 4321.3 and 4321.3 are independent education evaluations. Ms. Weiss. Thank you. Uh, the Board of Education recognizes the rights of parents and guardians of a student who has or is thought to have a disability to receive an independent evaluation as public, at public expense if they disagree with the evaluation obtained by the Committee on Special Education. In addition, the school district has the right to initiate an impartial hearing to demonstrate that its evaluation is appropriate. 
This uh, policy, along with the regulation that's attached to it, is really a procedure that's put in place for the district to ensure that, if, and this is the right of a special education student and the right of the district to dispute it, that um, we have procedures in place to ensure that a qualified evaluator is the person doing the um, evaluation, that that colleges are licensed, that other evaluators should be appropriately certified in their specialty area. Uh, it also puts some uh, structure to the uh, different types of evaluation, such as a neurological evaluation, educational evaluation, and others, and what their cost should be. Uh, in addition, addition, Mr. Frankfurt's um, really from our uh, past uh, practice and contracts that we've established with um, doctors and different agencies over the, over the years, has put together a very comprehensive list of evaluators as well as um, resources for independent evaluate, uh, evaluation right within the regulations of the policy. Um, so it gives us a lot of moving forward parents' choices on where to, to go for an evaluation and where a district would go, and it also makes it very clear what the uh, rights of a parent are and what the rights of the district are. First reading. Excellent. Anybody have any questions regarding this policy? Ms. Weiss, the, um, the resources for the independent evaluations, the actual providers, is that usually put into a policy? I believe. If we, if, um, let's say the CSC or the special ed department decides to use someone who's not on, on this list, do we have to amend the policy and add them? No. They would, they would be encouraged to follow the policy with people that we do have on the list. Okay. Um, however, it does state in the event that parents believe that a unique circumstances justify an independent evaluation is not followed in the above stated criteria, parents should submit to the Director of um, Special Education writing a specific request of an evaluation. Um, they have to follow the same criteria. So I believe that can be done. Um, I will get more information on that from our counsel and Mr. Franklin's for our second committee. Yeah, I was a little bit less concerned about parents saying, hey, you know, we don't want to use this one or that, that provider. I was more concerned with, hey, we, gotta, we have to get a neuropsych done quick, um, and we need to use a provider that maybe is, is newer or something. And let's say the district wants to use that provider, I don't want to pigeonhole the district into using what's on this policy and we have to pull to a first, second reading, wait, you know. Uh, it, okay. it definitely would not, but I'll, I'll get specifics on that. If it definitely would not, then that's that's great. Yeah, and, and just and, and just as a reminder, this will, we also vet these through our attorneys as well, these policies, so they look at that. But I do remember not too long ago, we had an RFP process that we were consistently kind of breaking our own policy to do what was right for children, which was good that we were doing that, right? But then we had to go back and change the policy. I didn't want to get back into the same pigeonhole where we added all these these uh, providers and then we're consistently breaking our own policy in the best interest of our students. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure that we could get language put into the policy through the legal. I, I, think, I think we are covered, but um, as I said, I will, I will get definitive response. Yeah, from that's something the policy committee will say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're on to the next policy, which is the first reading for policy number 9240, recruiting and hiring. Okay, this policy, um, uh, 9240, is also first reading. And again, this policy outlines our procedures in hiring. Um, we were asked by one of our auditors for a copy of this policy. Our policy was from 2009, so I thought it would probably be a good idea to update it. There's really not that much different about the policy. The language is a little bit different, uh, but it does, it talks about the Board of Education um, and their desire to make sure that we have a practice that provides due diligence and find the most qualified persons for any open positions. The board is committed to recruiting, employing, supporting, and retaining racially, ethnically, ethnically, this is way too late, and, uh, linguistically diverse, as well as culturally competent administration, instructional, and support personnel. So it really is, again, our policies and procedures within, within the district. For the second reading, I'd like to take this to the policy committee again and maybe come up with some specifics that we do um, as a district to make sure that we, that we are hiring the highest quality people possible. So um, again, just first reading and, and we'll get it back um, 
Thanks, Mark. Anyone have any questions regarding this policy? Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. We are now on to reports. I'm assuming I'm going to turn to you, Mr. Lowey, on the energy performance contract update. Thank you. So, uh, update to have you on the EPC project is currently JCI Johnson Controls is working on uh, finalizing and assembly, assembling our our package that's going to go up to NYSEN for review. We expect that to happen at the end of April. Uh, SED will review the project and that we expect to go through into July. Uh, they'll we'll go back and forth with our architects and JCI to talk about that. They'll so review it, they'll make comments, they'll ask for answers to questions, and we hope that to be finalized sometime in September. Uh, we expect to the district to welcome project financing in September and uh, with a construction date aimed around for some construction, not the outside construction, but the inside construction, to start in uh, October of this year with a completion date of the entire project in October of 2023. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone have any questions from this one? Our next one is the uh, capital project update. All right. Tim, before you go on this one, I just want to clarify for everyone, I apologize uh, ahead of time for this, but just for us, so our knowledge of what we're taking a look at, and if you know, I apologize if you know this already, so um, this item that's on here is about the bond that was passed. So for us, the language now changes, the bond was, we were approved, the bond was approved, the bond was a loan, so the community gave us a, a, the okay to take out this loan, this bond. Now we're working on, not a bond anymore, we're working on a capital project. So everything as we move forward, when we talk about the capital project, it's where the bond will fund that capital project. So if you know that already, I apologize, but for those that are listening, that's why you No, it's excellent clarification. The capital project and not the bond anymore. The bond was approved. Capital project report. So uh, Mr. Steinbell initiated, we are meeting bi-weekly now with uh, our architects as we move forward through the project so we can uh, keep track of things and report to the board and the community how things are progressing. Uh, at our last meeting we discussed uh, that uh, currently H2M has sent out an RFP a request for proposals for soil, soil boring and surveying for all throughout the five buildings in the district. And most importantly, we are beginning the process now for uh, developing an RFP to offer our construction manager. Uh, this is a key vital position for our project, for, 90, for a project this scope, $90 million. This is the, the firm that will represent the district and help manage the project for us. So we expect to go out uh, for our people that at the end of April. So there are two big happenings for the bonds. Uh, this is this the meeting. And the, R, the um, construction manager will be board approved, correct? Yes. So our are we looking to hire a entity to be the construction manager, or are we looking to hire a private individual? It'll probably be an entity, like a, a larger vendor, you know, with a staff. Okay. And the scope of that will all be in the RFP that's going out to permit? Correct. Okay. Can we review that? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, we are now on to the junior senior high school track update. Who's taking that? Uh, I'll take it. Yeah. Okay, so the track that we prepared last year uh, in our vendor's effort to get it done so we could use it as soon as possible, uh, it was laid down uh, in not temperature conducive, uh, temperature conducive atmosphere. They put it down, it was a little too chilly, and it didn't take. So the, the track has been coming up a little bit, if you will. Uh, it's, it looks like the, the rubber on it is, is, is shedding a little bit. Yeah, so, so the, you, I'm sorry, Tim. So if you go up to the track and put your foot down on it, some of the top pieces have come up. You can kind of like roll your feet like it gravels on pavement, kind of like that. Um, the gray that's painted, we took a trip up, we talked to the track coaches, uh, Tim and I, because we get uh, questions about why aren't the lines down and there's issues about what, uh, what, what we're seeing up there. Um, the top layer in some spots is coming off, so it's currently a gray color similar to this, um, but that top layer is coming off in spots and you see the black of the track. So Tim's been discussing this with the vendors. They're going to redo it, but they can't redo it until the temperature at night does not fall below 50 degrees. At no cost. So it just, so at no cost to us. It be 50 degrees. Right, at no cost, cost 
the uh, you know the track coaches. You know, we we had a long conversation with them. You know, they're getting by. They're figuring it out. They're, you know, they're having some challenges with where the lines are, and they're figuring their way of working through it. So there's a frustration level from them that we're frustrated and went down. We're frustrated. They're frustrated. Um, they said that there's three home meets. So with regard to the home meets, they said they're going to try to yeah, they'll figure out what they're going to do with the three home meets that they have. But it really just affects their daily practices and what they're doing. So they're chalking out distances and how far to run, et cetera, like that. It was also when we were up there looking at it, we also see that there's some challenge, some problems with the drains. At the end of the turf field, there's drains that are built in. The cement that's underneath them has collapsed in spots, so some of the, the drains are not where they need to be. Um, to me, it's interesting that you know, they've said they've come out and fix it. You know, they give us a, a rigmarole, but you know, Jim and Tim have been staying on top of them. But considering we're looking to put in one, two, three, four, five turf fields. We have some purchasing power right now. Yeah, you would think they would want to be uh, best behavior so that they could potentially win uh, that bid and, and be, be the contractor you know, that wins. But, uh, we'll see. Tim, I don't know if you have anything else to add. No, that pretty good. Yeah. Accurately sums it up. Can I, can I ask, obviously you don't know exactly when they're going to start, but do they have a, do they give us an estimated time or duration of how long the project from when they start to repair it to when it could be done? I think it just takes a few days and then they got to let it cure for a few days. So they're going to rip up what's there? No, no, just lay down, lay down the surface. On. They got, they're going to use a Zamboni-like machine that's going to come along and scrape it and suck it all up and do stuff and then they'll come in and they'll be okay. Anyone else? Okay, we are now on item four, which is a high school graduation. The chairs on the brand new turf field. Okay, so um, Mr. Alamo has come to Tim and I to talk about it, uh, the outdoor graduation. So back to the turf field graduation being held outside. Um, many chairs like that or what we would normally rent at those chairs. The folding chairs, chairs that have four bottom poles. Our concern is the pressure that's on those four bottoms pushing into our new turf and within the field. Um, so uh, Sal and uh, Mr. Lamo, excuse me, uh, spent some time uh, taking a look at a variety of different chairs that we could purchase because none of the companies rent those or any of the companies that we look to get them from can't find them. So here's where we're at. It cost us as a district $3,500 per year to rent the chairs for graduation. If we were to buy 600 chairs, it would cost us $32,000. And we would get chairs that have, instead of it being the four like that, it's flat. So we spread it out, it could go on the field and it, and it would push it in. So there's two areas where it's flat. The front would be connected, the back would be connected like a bar. Um, so in 10 years, in my mind, in 10 years, we could we use them once a year, we store them, we bring them back out in 10 years, it pays for itself. I would think the chairs would actually last a lot longer than 10 years because they're only be used once per year. Uh, we get these types of chairs, we don't have to worry about puncturing that turf field or any other turf field. Um, so the, you know, the conversation is should we cobble some of the money that's left over in the budget this year as we're finishing up the year and put it towards the purchase is the question that goes to you. Um, my recommendation is we head that way. Um, I don't know if I explained it well enough, but if I have any questions, let me know. But that is the direction uh, that we want to head, and we're kind of putting it towards one. Um, we would agree. Do we look at meat meds? <laughs> Not look at meat meds. <laughs> you know, we can't be the only school that's having this issue. Like, obviously, other schools probably have come up with a resolution. Is it out of the realm of possibility to share? Chairs with another district. I mean, chairs. Yeah, chairs. yeah, you know, like I mean, it might sound ridiculous, but like, no, no, it's we're not, not the only, same day. The only problem is, that a lot of times they're on the same day. Okay. They're usually, okay. not always on the same day, but they usually some do Thursday, which is real early. Like also Friday or Saturday, and then you have a handful on Sunday. And most of my counterparts are renting them. Like, well, like we will be. Oh, we can't find the ones we want. So being that it is brand new, we want to try to make sure it's protected. Tennis courts. Yeah, we talked about all those. Yeah, those guys are right. We have Deaton Avenue and Tuttle House. The basement here. Oh wait, no, the basement here. 
<laughs> We're going to store it in the boardroom. <laughs> so is everybody okay with us looking for the purchase and hanging on to them for a minimum of 10 years? Yes. Yes? No? Yeah. I'll be with it. We would use it for other things. Do we rent chairs at Eastport for their outside graduation in Dayton? No, they seem to have enough. They just pull them from inside the building? Yeah. I, I, I don't recall that any of those, it's, they seem short chairs, but that we would have these to back it up. The thing is they also want to set the area up ahead of time, too, so that's why you can share them. But, no, I just, I just, yeah, no, it's great. It's, it's an idea. Is, there any, is there anything else we need for outdoor graduation that maybe we should buy instead of rent every year? If this is going to be a practice moving forward. Not a monster sound system. But we're working on that. We have that already. Oh, the question was, is there anything else we should? I mean, we had, we had discussed at one yeah. point, you have the stands in the front and then the stands in the back. That's all. We, do we rent those stands that they, or do we, have, do we put seats up in the back that you don't remember? On the field, there were seats. There were seats. seats on the field, and then on the away side, there's a small set of stands. I know that I thought that was something that we had mentioned, maybe putting up stands, maybe wrapping them as part of the, uh, Capital project. Excellent. Okay. Potential ideas. Thank but you. I don't think we we didn't that didn't get that didn't make it for a bit. An right. extension of uh, on the away side stands. No. Actually, it could be something down the road like if things come low, we can look to add. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Now the uh, last one's board committees. Anybody have any updates on board committees? Um, budget committee met on the 23rd of March at 4.30, but between 4.30 and 6.30, it was attended by me, Mr. Me, Mr. Lavi, and Mr. Rocco. Um, a lot of stuff that we discussed since our first one went over revenues, we wanted to go over expenditures. Um, but Mr. Lavi had also um, explained and, and you know, presented to us about the, a lot of things that you mentioned tonight about the solar farm pilot adjustment. Um, the Eastport Capital Project building aid that you know the two year ship on that um, you know caught uh, Ms. Rocket up on the e EPC project and you know we discussed those repairs uh, talked about the state aid increase and then the expense driven reimbursements decreasing at the time which reduced the amount of state aid that we were getting and that's pretty much it so everything that we talked about tonight that's what we were there's a lot of moving parts with that cap this year we spent the time on and I know it's one of your most right. favorite subjects to, to talk about. I do. do you like I'm not, not trying to be facetious. I'm being serious. <laughs> Anything Good. else? Have any more about committees? Um, Mr. Governor and I had a uh, health, safety, and security committee meeting the same day as the wellness fair. Um, we did have one person in attendance, and uh, we spoke about the uh, fitness stations that are going to be part of our capital project that are going to be at different places during our one mile fitness track that's being installed. Um, it was an early conversation. Just um, there were some really good points spoken about, um, about getting different stakeholders in the community um, involved in picking out what those stations are going to look like so that we have more community members coming up here and using the brand new facility that we had and that was paid for by the taxpayers. Mr. Governor, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, we were just going to get some input from, uh, from you know, Gazette, from you know, uh, some suggestions were to reach out to the local uh, law enforcement agencies because, uh, and the military because they, um, when they bring their recruits, they're working on different things, different exercises, so maybe we can get uh, some of those machines or devices that would be useful for them and then we can have local people uh, you know, preparing for uh, whatever that next going to be. Yeah, we, we had a community member there, um, Mr. Fibo, and he was uh, mentioning um, about, you know, possibly if you get those groups, like the ROTC guys, or even, you know, the, the, the Suffolk County PD and the sheriffs involved here, well, it's kind of cool to have them come here doing their workouts on our grounds. It's kind of inviting. It's always nice to have a law enforcement presence. Uh, let it be on the weekends or after hours coming and using this facility and kind of showing off what we're giving back to the community. Excellent. Thank you very much. Anyone else? 
Okay, we are now on the public participation segment invitation. This is the portion where things that are not on the agenda. Anyone have any questions? Okay, ESM Pride. All right, here again. Um, so this, this past Saturday, uh, family fun night, we decided to, me and my wife and my daughter decided to attend the, um, the Adams family here at high school. It was a wonderful, it was a fantastic show. Um, from the actors to the music to the set design and everything, uh, you know, Morticia and Gomez were just, they just kept cap cap at least they kept me captivated with their line delivery. It was just spot on, I thought. Um, you know, Grandma and Fester were hilarious. Uh, it was fun watching that dynamic and that relationship between Pugsley and Wednesday. And, uh, you know, the Beinekees as well and the ancestors, they were all great in, in that whole thing. That pit band was smooth, it, it went without a hitch, like it, they were flawless and they were just, they were fun to listen to as well. I think my head started bopping when they were playing great through the video, because they just had such a nice little groove to it. And like I said, the set design was great, and those mural backdrops they had, just the painting skill that went into those, it was just, it, well, excellent. It was, a, it was a great, it was a, a wonderful thing to do with family that night, so. Anyone else? I, I had the privilege of attending the um, Parish Art Museum on when was it? The March 12th, which our students' work uh, K through 12 was displayed. Uh, that was the preview day, and it was such a pleasure to be able to see all of the wonderful work that the students are. Um, creating in art classes across the district. And um, I just wanted to say a special thank you to the art teachers who are doing amazing things with our students at all grade levels. And it was really cool. I brought my son too, so it was really great for him to be able to see stuff that um, students have worked on across the district and you know see the things that he can aspire to work on one day too. So I, I gotta ask you, because I went last year and it was COVID crazy last year. They wouldn't let you touch the walls. You couldn't stand in one spot for too long. How was it this year? <laughs> Well, you, you did have to wear a mask, so um, that was, but it was really good. They had, um, they, they weren't, you know, oh, crazy. They, they, like, we, like, we were allowed to eat cookies in there. Oh, okay. We were able to, you know, eat cookies, so I think it was. Um, and you could touch the wall. And, yeah. yeah. We, Last year was, was, was We tried was not stuff. to, but, you know, I didn't test that. No, no, there, there were blank spots on the walls, and if you leaned against the wall, they actually moved you along. I didn't try doing that, I don't know, but, you know. Great. It was fun. It was fun. It is. A, it is a nice show. I know. Yeah. Yes. Ms. Rafferty, you have something? Yes, I attended the wellness uh, fair, so I just wanted to say thank you for all the hard work. I know that you worked very, very hard. Um, There's just a lot of wonderful vendors and very well received. Um, I was hoping there would be more people there, but everybody worked very, very hard. So, yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful job. Lots of great. Um, opportunities for people to speak with so thank you thank you very much okay we are now on to what is that r right r the adjournment can i have a motion please motion. Motion. all in favor aye, aye. 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 everybody be good